15 meters a minute. I'm 60 off bottom. Increasing speed. About 20. Tether's going off to our port signs. Yeah. I'm 50 off bottom. Serio, 60 meters off bottom, paying out 20 meters a minute. Copy that, 20 meters a minute. Starting to see bottom, I'm um, 33 off, 32 off. Yeah, bottom it looks like it's off to our side. starboard some. Yeah, I'm going to get down here. Get a look. You've got bottom. So on my speed. Serio's 40 meters off bottom. Morning and welcome to the Seems bottom. To Today right is dive to nine yeah. of our Deep you Connections expedition, right leg speed. two. Yep. Just in five degrees for now. Our dive today is on Retriever Seamount, which is one of the four seamounts within the uh, Northeast Canyons and Seamounts Marine National Monument. We are currently at a depth of 2,659 meters, and I am your biology lead, Megan Putz, from the University of Hawaii. Good morning. This is your geology lead, Jeff Obeltz, from the Naval Research Lab. We have just hit bottom, as Megan said, on dive number nine of the X-1905 leg two. And, uh, we Holding are there? getting some yeah, great uh, shots already. Uh, big rock here. We had a we had a big sponge off. party yesterday, yeah, and uh, winch deck. We are at right, thirty meters off bottom. Off Copilot is start. off winch. We've got a lot of those uh, eerie Three bright off. white silhouettes that we, we can immediately will stand identify by until as I'm these given cool the okay sponges by and a variety of and morphologies, as well as a rubble and talus field, pretty similar to what we were seeing Copy that. We're going to Berenza yesterday. I Tip think you're up. right, Jeff. Camera. It might be a spongy Camera. day again. Yeah. A forecast of sponges. Try auto altitude here in a moment. So the sponges we're seeing are it's actually right uh, types of rock. glass sponges, meaning that they have a bunch of uh, different types yeah. of glass uh, pieces that make up their skeleton. Auto altitude. And those pieces are known as spicules. Every sp uh, species of glass sponge has a very unique set of spicules. Well, that's interesting. The uh, rock box closed itself. And as we get settled here on the bottom, uh, it might take so a few moments for our ROV treasure. team to get ready uh, to start viewing some closed. of these animals. My head uh, and a we bit. will wait patiently yeah, and tell you more the, uh, about today's dive. Hard. Yeah, so our bottom oh, depth is 20,650 right oh. meters off. thereabouts. Uh, I believe this will be our deepest Sorry, say again? Or the line on just the fell down. Dive that we have ah, so I'm going to pull it up real quick. Tomorrow we're going to be slightly deeper at a depth of approximately 3,000 meters, but that's going to be our midwater dive in which we are making transects through the water column instead of hugging the bottom to look at all the cool benthic stuff as we're doing right now.
so far I'm seeing a lot of the same animals that we were seeing on yesterday's dive. Uh, very large glass sponges, um, seeing some rosellid vase sponges as well as some uh, corbitellony Swing arms uh, base or anything sponges. Else pilot? Yeah, you might as well get everything. Kind of interested in some of these pink corals that we're seeing. I'm wondering this, if this they are Paragorgia, but I they sort of put everything out so we can light look it up. like a corallium uh, to me. The Just the, the color and the it's shape of the colonies rock. from some this distance like on the uh, remind me yeah, of the sure pink cool. corals that I don't, uh, we see I'm oftentimes on sea mounts. On one big rock, I haven't seen anything else. And that's one of our outstanding questions with this expedition, right, Megan, is to look at these. Sea mounts, which are kind here. of islands in the deep sea. Yeah. Sometimes when they breach the surface, they literally become islands, but they're kind of uh, islands in terms of the relief, uh, steep slopes, as well as the big variety of depth ranges they offer in what is otherwise a pretty uniformly deep and fine sedimented environment in the deep ocean. So, one of our outstanding questions was kind of what's the biological connectivity between these seamounts that are relatively far spaced considering if you were a uh, sessile sponge or coral um, that reproduces by How's that look, Sean, the right side off. Tension good? That's right, Jeff. Uh, these seamounts and also canyons are relatively isolated yeah, areas good. that um, host a lot of diversity in terms of the sponge and coral uh, animals that we're seeing right now. And one of the major questions is, how do these animals get here uh, from one seamount to another? One theory suggests that uh, seamounts and seamount chains, like the chain that this seamount, retriever seamount, belongs to, can act as stepping stones across ocean basins for these animals to genetically make their tracks across an ocean. So. A lot of scientists are actually studying uh, the genetic connectivity between different populations on different seamounts across ocean basins like the Atlantic Ocean and also the Pacific Ocean. Yeah, and that's why for all the samples that we've been collecting on this expedition, we've been taking small subsamples or clippings and preserving them specifically for um, genetic experimentations that will be done at a later time. A lot of these may look morphologically similar, but belong to genetically separate populations. That looks good, Bobby. I'm going to... Uh meander around a so little geologically bit as we uh yeah, we up. get settled with our two-body so rov control. system right now okay. we can okay. notice uh pretty distinctively that everything we're seeing is a pretty dark color All right, and moving um, back to the range of a dark uh, gray about. to kind of black that makes sense considering this is all igneous or volcanically sourced material that we're looking at right now the seamount chain that we're seeing right now was produced by a hot spot Water which is what on. happens when an area of the mantle is anomalously hotter than the mantle around it. And All right, those we got water. who may not know, the mantle turn is up, the down. area of the Earth that um, is hold that for now. plastic okay. or Try kind turning of down liquid, a little. but not really turn liquid, down. kind of squishy, I think maybe is the best word for it, underneath the yeah, lithosphere, which is the solid, brittle part of the Earth. So a hot spot forms when there's a relatively hot part of the mantle that intrudes through the lithosphere or the crust and um, starts injecting lava up onto the either ocean floor or land. All right, Dan, try to go down a little more. To be. In this case, it was the ocean floor. That's down. And this hot spot right, come back was up active where... between approximately 125 and 80 yeah, right there. million I think that years good. and left itself okay, a chain that. of evidence of its passing as the continental plate moved over the relatively stationary hot spot. Are we just leaving the greaser on? Okay, uh, that looks good to me. If Kopai wants to uh, yeah, test it for us. Which is clear. Feel free to move the uh, winch up and down. Co-pilot here. I hear winch and deck are so clear. So as we examine the uh, benthic community here, 
these corals and sponges and all the associated organisms that we see with these corals and sponges, we start to notice these patterns of connectivity. And that shows us how the oceans know no boundaries. Uh, the boundaries that people put in place, Paying having out, so. places belong to one country or another, aren't really seen within the ocean. Uh, there is exchange of genetic material, uh, movement of animals across many places within the oceans. Stopping. And so it's really important to study transboundary uh, in areas that are close to both the U.S. Uh, continental margin and also the Canadian continental margin in order to understand how these areas are connected. Absolutely, and hence right, our expedition uh, looks good on our end. connections right, refers to both the physical now. connections that these that? features represent, in the seamount being the uh, chain, as you said, that links uh, biologically connected groups as well as and connections between, in this now. case, Canada and the U.S., exploring these areas together. So this coral that we're looking at How is look? very large. Uh, yeah, you can so see the lasers, our... those two red dots Roger, that are on this are coral fan, with the those are 10 centimeters or 4 inches across. Yeah, I'm just packing it up and right now. We're uh, disconnected. Let's see. So One, are we two, removing three, the four. clam shell from the At cable? At least go, half a meter go, across. Go, That's a pretty Understood. big fan. So I have permission and to winch at will? This definitely looks winch like a corallium coral to, Deck, to me. Deck, are you the same? Um, winch at will? Also known as pink coral. Yeah, Deck's all good. Winch at will. Roger you that. can tell, so like, if you compare it to what we saw yesterday, that really brightly reddish pink uh, coral, uh, the polyps at the ends of the branches uh, aren't fo forming those sort of balls that look a little bit like bubblegum balls. So it's not a bubblegum coral, but actually a pink coral, which is in a group of corals that are sometimes known as precious corals because a coral like this... Um, has a very hard skeleton that people uh, for many, many yeah, years have used as uh, jewelry and, or Let's adornment. Do uh, the first example of this was seen, I think, in sure. uh, ancient Germany. Uh, they found some the pieces pilot. of uh, coral that had been carved into beads. And as we drift away from this uh, very beautiful white pink coral, I state as only a slight exaggeration that I think the red crab may be the only thing we've seen on this expedition whose common name is the same as its actual color. Well, this coral is actually pink in color, uh, and some corallium are known as red corals because their skeleton is very, very red. Um, that red coral generally is found within the Mediterranean Sea, uh, that deep, deep red color uh, that you associate with uh, corallium coral. But uh, we usually call these corals pink corals uh, in the Pacific because the skeleton doesn't get that rich, deep red color, uh, but is a really beautiful uh, pink or a deep pink color to a near white. So that's a really great observation. I remember uh, during our first dive Can at the gully uh, within the marine protected area in Canada, yeah. um, our Canadian partners were mentioning that corallium is a rel is found in these areas, but it isn't as abundant as, say, the Paragorgia corals. We're also seeing a number of different kinds of sponges, uh, lots of glass sponges that are either vase-shaped, leaf-like. Uh, this is a very dense deep-sea no coral community that, that we're viewing. Nice seeing okay. also a number okay. of uh, demo sponges, those very rounded, globular-looking um, okay. yellow sponges encrusting these rocks as well. Yeah, I think if you were making a cookbook for deep sea life, I think this area is pretty much has all the bases covered. We've got plenty of hard substrate for the sessile organisms that like to have their food brought to them to take advantage of, as well as relief off the seabed. And also, you can probably notice if you lean into your monitor a little bit uh, and see individual particles going by, you can notice a pretty robust along 
a long bottom current that we can see that if I had to eyeball from when the ROV was standing a little bit stationary, it's probably on the order of about a half a meter per second, which is moving pretty good, um, well enough to bring some of this food in the form of marine snow and detritus to these organisms that they rely on for their food. And this large sponge that we're seeing right in the middle of our screen is actually a dead sponge. And we can tell that it's dead because it's no longer has that, you know, white translucent look to it like the other sponges that we're seeing in view. And that's because after the sponge dies, the skeleton gets clogged up with uh, sediment and particles from the water, giving it that brown tinge. All right, Bobby, that and you can down. see uh, there's another example of this hemichorallium, this pink coral, uh, right next to the sponge that is a bit darker in color. And underneath this sponge, we're also Wanna seeing a another? bamboo coral. Sure. Same thing. Okay, we can come on. I don't know how quickly we need to move today. Yeah, and it looks like behind that uh, sponge yeah, that at least superficially yeah, appears to be moves. similar to that uh, really melting yeah, candle-like one that we saw yesterday. Get an idea I think that's an even better example of it that we've got front and center right now thing. next to the dead sponge, too. All right, on the way. Yeah, looking at that melting sponge... Uh, sponge that we were looking at uh, yesterday, it does have a similar feature, but the one we were looking at um, seems to me to be in the family Corbitellinae, and the one we were looking at yesterday had a much more regular dictyonal framework, that sort of crisscrossing, squared up, um, very organized look to it. So I'm thinking they could be different. call up add another five? But it's not unusual to see similar uh, forms across different species and different families of sponges. Yeah, and all these on. lighter spots on the rock are also sponges. They're an encrusting yeah, type of sponge in the demosponge group. And right now we're coming in on a small squat lobster. It's bright white. That squat watcher is Munidopsis. I'm going to have a toe down here in a second. And as we get a closer look, you'll notice some really large spikes along the carapace of this squat lobster, and it has a very long upturned rostrum. That's that okay. uh, spine Same that's more. between the eyes. Go a little bit tighter. There we go. There we go. Now we have a nice good look. Really conspicuously different from the bright orange squat lobsters that we were seeing on Bear Seamount yesterday. And they do have a difference in color, and they might be different species, huge. but uh, it was in the same genus, yeah, Munidopsis. And this squat lobster, if it wanted to, uh, could do that backward swimming motion that you enjoyed so much. This one is looking pretty mellow, though, right now. Just uh, hanging stationary on this rock. Yeah, slow pull out, and I'll fly off. I've noticed that the white squat lobsters tend to be a little more uh, bold and aloof compared to the colored ones. But that just now might be uh, my, my personal opinion. Thank you. It's also interesting looking at the walls of Retriever Seamount right now and noting that compared to some of the walls that we were observing in some of the really sheer outcroppings in submarine canyons, these walls are much less biologically encrusted than those ones in which I couldn't even make a tentative diagnosis or a uh, 
best guess at what the rock type was because it was just entirely encrusted in biology. In this case, we do have a fair amount of encrusting sponges and corals, but I can get a pretty good look at the igneous material beneath it and see that there is a larger, uh, I don't know whether you call them clasts in igneous geology, but I would call them clasts if it was sedimentary material uh, interspersed between the overall what looks like a finer grain with a smaller crystals matrix that composes most of the material. And a quick zoom so on the coral. So I believe that uh, the reason why you're not seeing so much coverage yeah, uh, on those rocks compared to the um, submarine canyons we were surveying is a, probably a function of depth. If we were further up, you'd probably yeah. see a lot more Nobody's encrustation, but wide. we are seeing quite a bit of this uh, encrusting demosponge covering the rocks. And what you were mentioning before about the class, um, you can see how this substrate looks very sort of smoothed out. It's not very rugged or um, jagged and that is the manganese crust coating over all of these um, both pillow flows and uh, probably some pieces of talus. So manganese crusting can actually consolidate uh, smaller rocks into a firm bedrock substrate. Yeah, and given this appearance in our location right now, the toe of the seamount proper, I have to assume that what we're seeing right now is actually a really large talus field instead of the actual seamount itself. So this would be you if you're stepping back and looking at a canyon wall and you notice so uh, kind of fans of debris sonar, at the base of it, that's probably what we're looking at right now. But given the amount of the manganese crusting, I would say yeah, that uh, this talus field has been relatively stable for a uh, yep. very long time. Um, 20 meters? Manganese yeah, crust has a hard time it, forming on substrates that Let's move around too much. On the way. You well, said three... Looks three like we have five. an enemy three, to our five, lower five. right as well, which I believe we only saw one of during our dive yesterday, our representative Where's Waldo style Venus flytrap an enemy that I believe we've seen on every dive during this expedition. Nope, this is not a Venus flytrap an enemy. This is an actinus stolid an enemy that has the small little bulbs at the end of the uh, tentacles. And these anemones can get rather large. I've seen the them queue. be uh, yeah. like almost 30 centimeters across the disc. Pilot, can we keep the lasers on? Lasers coming on. Uh, there they are. Thank you. I'll get them over there here in just a so second. So this anemone is probably... It's over 10 centimeters across, maybe 15, I would say. So a pretty good specimen of this actinus stolid anemone. There we go. The characterizing feature um, is those rounded bulbs at the end of the tentacles. And it looks like there might be a mini-me of it. I can't quite see uh, to the lower right of it as well. We can zoom some more. I think that might actually be a cup coral that we're seeing right at the base of this uh, anemone. Oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, as you zoom in, we can see uh, the calyx, or yeah. basically the uh, yeah, coral's house. Bit, I'm just too uh, much. There we and go. then the tentacles are reaching out and around. You can see that light, more translucent tissue uh, of the coral itself. Okay, we can do a slow pull to one. And I think probably because of the relatively vigorous currents in this area, we're having a, a little bit of issues remaining stationary and getting some of the uh, really rock solid uh, zooms that you might be used to with uh, Deep Discover and Sirius. Usually Sirius takes uh, all of the ship's motion out of play and then there's a long tether that isolates 
Deep Discover motion-wise from Sirius. But we talked a lot yesterday, and we'll mention again today, uh, the effect that seamounts have on seafloor currents in terms of splitting them, redirecting them, accelerating them in places, as well as just generally creating turbulence. So it's not a surprise that uh, the currents in this area would be doing interesting and fast things. Wowzers. Wow, yeah, this is a great feature. If you take a look at the Sirius view, we're approaching uh, a very tall feature on this seamount, and it's just covered in sponges. Wall of wonder. I've also noticed uh, this pattern of when we're diving at depths greater than 2,000 meters, we tend to see more glass sponges uh, more frequently than uh, we see the corals. And it, in sort of those intermediate depths between uh, 1,000 and 2,000 meters, we see high density coral communities. And it would be really interesting to actually look at the data that's been collected and, and see if that uh, pattern that I seem to be recognizing is actually true. So sometimes while well, we're just, uh, we watch a lot of these videos, we're w uh, watching this live feed, we start to notice patterns of associations between organisms and corals and patterns of what corals and sponges we see at certain depths. And what's those are really great observations but sometimes our mind can trick us into thinking we're seeing uh, these patterns when, you know, the data, um, the statistics don't actually show that. But it would be a really interesting question to go back through the annotation data um, from a dive like this and other dives at these depths to see if there is an association between depth and sponge communities and depth and uh, coral communities. But both corals and sponges provide a lot of habitat in the deep sea environment for other associated organisms like brittle stars, shrimps, crabs, and fish, just to name a few. Go pilot, this is Winch. Speaking of fish, there's one Go fish, winch. probably a rat tail I'm fish, just, uh, that wrapping up, swam cleaning very up the quickly air. through our Let screen. Let me you know, toss a polo on and I'll come in to believe you. And I'm thinking Understood, this no rush. really large yellow plate coral is right. the same Co coral that we that collected on uh, our dive at Kinlan Canyon. It looks very similar, but much, so much larger than the specimen that, or the specimens that we saw during that dive. It's a type of demisponge. We're also seeing a lot of these very um, lacy plate-like uh, translucent sponges that might be in the family Eurydidae, uh, po possibly a type of conolasma. That's the genus conolasma, another type of glass sponge. Pilot, can we zoom this uh, small uh, coral right in center screen, lower screen, with the oh, little star on it? Yes. So I'm thinking that this coral Which that I comes? spotted with this brittle star on the top is a type of primnoid coral. And as we get a better look at it, uh, we're going to take a look at the polyps on this coral, and that will tell us what family it belongs to. So primnoid corals have plates along the main body of their uh, polyps. Uh, it kind of looks like it, they're scaled. Whereas um, a bamboo coral will have sclerites along the body of its polyps. Okay, video, we can start a zoom. And sclerites kind of look like little hairs almost. Yeah, just come on in. Oh, 
Oh, these polyps are very tiny. Cut me in some more. Yeah, and that brittle star looks like it's hanging on for dear life in the current, uh, which looks to be pretty high right at the peak of this huge boulder that we've seen encrusted with numerous corals and sponges. So I believe this coral is a primnoid coral, given the small size of the polyps and how they sort of constrict. They don't, I'm not seeing the um, bamboo banding yeah. of black and white pieces uh, along the main axis the of this coral. So it's not a bamboo coral. And with our wonderful zoom, I'm definitely making out those scales along the body of the polyps. So this is a primnoid coral. And I would probably classify it as a, uh, an unbranched primnoid coral. So there are a number of unbranched um, corals out there acting like whips, very much like the whip corals that we were seeing during yesterday's dive. But this coral is not going to get that long compared to those really long bamboo whips that we saw yesterday. And then the um, brittle star at the top is in the family Ophiocanthidae. And they're pretty conspicuous uh, because they have these very long spines along their arms. Pilot, are we able to take samples today? We are. Great, thanks. And full wide, please. Anything else of uh, interest for a tight zoom before I let go of this rock here? Um, yes, please, Pilot. Can we zoom that sort of brambly uh, looking bit brambly just bit to the under right? the lasers? Yeah. yeah okay. It looked like there was a bunch of yeah, interesting animals in, there. Brian. So this looks like it's a piece of dead come coral in. that has been colonized uh, by so an array of organisms. So we're seeing a Munodopsis squat lobster crawling along those dead branches. There's a bunch of barnacles that have taken up residence on this coral, uh, along with some sponges I'm seeing. Yeah. Yeah, that's a bunch of sponge material wrapping around the branches. So the sponges are taking over. And those small little branching bits uh, that are very delicate are hydrozoans. Also seeing some amphipods and perhaps some live bits of coral uh, between some of these dead branches. And those live bits of coral, that white coral, looks like it's probably a type of plexorid coral. I'm not getting anything past 40 meters here. Okay. So that goes to show how even after death, uh, a coral colony can provide a lot of habitat yeah, to the deep sea environment, so sure uh, supporting a vast array of angle. different types of animals, from barnacles, yeah, so crustaceans, to sponges, to hydroids, to amphipods, um, brittle stars, and so many more. And this little community that we're looking at right now isn't a anomaly. Any any one of these foundational species that we're looking at here, alive or dead, if we took a zoom on it, we would see kind of a similar diversity of organisms from the really small amphipods all the way up to uh, some shrimp or potentially fish living at the base of them and the ever-present brittle stars that seem to be always around them. Okay, we can come wide slow. Yeah, that was a great small community. And it also okay. goes to show how as you keep zooming in on the bottom, the more and more you see. So when we're really far off the bottom, looking down, it we only really see these very, very large, conspicuous white sponges. But there's more than that down here. There is 
animals in cracks and crevices, hiding in the branches and lobes of these sponges and corals. And then, not to mention, all of the encrusting demisponges that are covering the rocks. So these rocks would definitely look a lot more black and shiny if they didn't have all this, as you put it, biology all over them. And that even applies as well, even if we go to areas without the hard substrate, um, which we don't tend to focus on on these expeditions because they're not so visually interesting to look at. But whenever we've done any sort of deep zooms in areas, we had one site uh, when we were searching for Vizella or Russian hat sponges that was almost entirely self-sediment. And anywhere in that area, when we zoomed, it was always spectacular to see the biodiversity on what appeared to be a featureless area of seafloor, but it ended up to be its own little community uh, full of epibenthic or living on the surface as well as in fauna or those that are burrowing within uh, the surface. It was just full of life, uh, just a different kind of life than the kind of uh, charismatic sponges and corals that we love to focus on in these expeditions. I also saw an interesting stock sponge uh, as you were talking, Jeff, um, that I was trying to figure out if it was, I had two okay. genus or genera in yeah, mind, uh, the, the hylostylus or crateromorpha. And I'm thinking it was more of a crateromorpha. It was a very long, thin stalk with a bell of the sponge that had an open osculum on top. So if we see another right. one of those today, it'd be a good to get a look at it. I think we can do five meters, Chris. Okay. Get a little bit closer. Three one five or three two zero. Uh, let's go with our new one. Three two five. Three and two these five. large, oh, thirty five or ten. Sort of base like uh, plate like cool. sponges. Okay, okay. I, I think okay. belong to the Four genus up. Atlantisella, which is another yeah. glass three, sponge um, that starts off as a very small vase, but it doesn't grow tall, it sort of grows wide, looking like a, a sort of a wide-brimmed hat or those fancy uh, decorative plates that you often see in stores. Or like the Chihuly um, gla uh, yeah, blown yeah, it's glass. Hard to tell, Bobby. It's either a wall uh, installations. or it just levels out. It might be a a, a blade. And yeah. we're coming upon a lot of the it's vase sponges that blade. we saw pretty heavily, especially it's towards the, the beginning of our dive now. yesterday, with really ornate, elaborate uh, folds around their osculums or their openings. Pilot, can we take a look at some of these uh, very wide vase sponges right in front of us? Yes. Uh, to the lower left or center screen? Uh, just straight ahead. Center screen, aye. Okay. I'm a little stretched out. I'll try to give you a view here. Let's zoom in uh, video just right from here. So as we make a zoom on this sponge, I'm going to be looking at... Uh, the framework of the sponge, how it forms its vase. Trying to look a little bit more carefully at the framework just to try to understand possibly what uh, family this sponge can belong to. Uh, given its Good shape, I, kept, I keep saying yeah. it might be Atlanticella, uh, but a lot of sponges form these vase-like shapes. Uh, as the water passes across the osculum, this top opening of the sponge, uh, water can get go through that shape very easily and bring food and uh, oxygen to the animal itself. So all the cells within this uh, sponge tissue and its and skeleton. <clears throat> So I'll get it here in a second. I'm just getting a toe down. And this one, similar to the one yes, that we please. saw, I believe, That's in good. the unnamed okay. Minor Canyon, looks fairly full of uh, sediment on the inside. You can see it because it's fairly translucent. So that kind of uh, indicates and gives a clue how some of them that shed off the walls and we find uh, dead down 
um, at the floor of these seamounts like we did yesterday, Take that tends to happen. They don't really oh, have an yeah. active way to blues, get if you got them. the sediment out of the their the main up. canal that forms their body, yeah. even though they do have the ability to remove it from the kind of inside of the matrix of the sponge's body. Okay, I'm stable video. You can. So as we're looking at this, Atlanticella should look more like it has little round pockets, but this sponge has a very regular um, framework where you're, it looks like uh, cross-hatching almost. And so that makes me think that this is more of a hard, so. crunchy uh, sponge, and therefore it wouldn't be uh, in the Euplectelidae family, wouldn't be Atlanticella. Uh, but probably something uh, in the Spectralophora, perhaps a uh, Uretid in the family Uretidae. And it looks like also on the underside of it, there's some uh, branching little, I believe those are rhizoans uh, coming off of the sponge's body. Uh, they could be bryozoans, or they uh, are likely hydrozoans. I really love the texture of this sponge. It looks like really delicate lace. And really uh, tight knit spicules, which stands kind of in contrast to some of the ones that we were looking at and doing close okay. zooms of yesterday, which right. seem to have more widely spaced. And that that's kind of uh, that kind of controls the texture of the sponge. Is that right? That's right, Jeff. So uh, how the spicules are laid out in the skeleton will definitely control uh, how soft or how crunchy these sponges are. And the only way to really tell if it's soft or crunchy is to, you know, actually touch it. Um, but the framework also it's gives uh, a little bit of information away of yeah, how this sponge out, might feel uh, based on how regular that framework w looks and how it moves or doesn't move in the water. I was going to guess you have to eat it to be sure, but then again, geologists are pretty known for putting their samples in their mouth to assess various things like salinity and grain size. Yeah, it's it's not always best to try to eat your science. Um, we don't usually eat the rocks, we just lick them. Oh, okay. Probably not best to lick the biology. Uh, because the sponge is full of glass, you probably wouldn't have the greatest experience with that. So, this looks very Dr. Seuss. Ooh, I really like this sort of long, wavy Do one at the bottom left-hand corner. Right yeah, and if you're not getting audio from the pilots in our ROV team, one of them, I think, just made a correct assessment and said that this area is looking very Dr. Seuss-like with all the abstract shapes and kind of a uh, zany forest-like aspect. Yeah, in fact, there was one dive uh, during the capstone expedition in the Pacific that was dubbed Forest of the Weird because there were so many weird sponges that were very densely packed in this small area. And it was really exciting for the leads on, on board. Uh, one of them was Chris Kelly, who has a passion for these glass sponges and deep sea sponges in general. So it was quite a fun experience. Uh, to check out that forest of the weird and there is a video made about it uh, that you can see on the website oceanexplorer.noaa.gov and you can also can check out it? videos from our expedition the uh, deep connections expedition how's it looking out ahead there co-pilot pilot so can we wall. zoom I'm on sure that bell a, that's floating in the center screen either a wall or a spire or one or the other 
I keep seeing these uh, long stocks with the sponge bell at the top. And there are a few uh, guesses that I have as to what that sponge might be. Um, one of them is a type of uh, sponge called uh, Hylostylus or Caridia morpha. Looks like it may flatten out a little bit here at the top. Yeah. I'm also seeing this really sort of weird pink. Care if I mess with your sonar copilot? I don't yeah, think I've ever seen a sponge be pink. We've seen some yellow, we've seen some brown, and I have seen purple, but not yet pink. Like coming to the top of this feature there, pilot. Yeah, it maybe. Kind of goes off to your port a little. Yeah, we'll look over this away. Pilot, when we get a chance, can we check out that uh, sort of pinkish-looking sponge mass? Yes, pinkish sponge mass. Ask. Yeah, it's my favorite, the uh, the cake sponge. I mean, the sponge cake. Sponge cake sponge. <laughs> the sponge cake sponge. That's that really round uh, yellow on the outside, white on the top sponge. We did collect one of those sponges, and we believe it's actually two separate sponges, uh, the yellow part actually being a different sponge that has grown along the outside of this white uh, geodia sponge. Yeah, I remember that was a really extensive debate and the reason that we Good took two separate samples of that soon. sponge on the outer and inner part of it for a genetic analysis to figure out once and for all whether it's one or two different sponges. And the weird thing about that sponge was when we brought it up yeah, and it got exposed to air and then preserved in ethanol, uh, that yellow part of the sponge turned black and then dyed the ethanol like this crazy purple color. So this sponge that we're looking at right now is, I believe, in the subfamily Corbitellini, part of the Euplectality family of uh, glass sponges, but I've never seen it be pink before. This is crazy. I have seen some uh, that form these tubes just like this, but it was more of a uh, translucent purple color, but this is very different. And more. that uh, sponge that I saw was at a much deeper depth in the yeah, Pacific, and it was just a singular vase, and this seems to grow in really dense clumps. And it doesn't look like uh, Hertwigia, uh, which we did see in yellow and also in white, which is also in the same family. Pilot, do you think it'd be possible to collect this? Uh, yeah, we could do that, I think. It should be relatively soft and squishy and easy to pull off a small piece. Probably a suction sampler kind of a job here. Let me get the vehicle parked and I'll talk to my team. Wide, please, video. All right, we're going to try to settle down and get a sample like you're still of this swinging, really huh? distinctive yeah, pink moving, red looking slightly. sponge, um, which we believe might be a job for the, the suction yeah, sampler yeah, given how I'll soft get, it's I'm expected to be. Set up on this ledge here. Oh, but wait a minute. We got to get the. Uh, actually, we got to push the uh, drawer out before I park. Yeah. The. Um, so I'll let you get that set up. And while we're uh, uh, getting settled up, you see this sponge right here out. that sort of folded over you when the, the thruster yeah. uh, backed yeah, that up. Fly that looks a lot more moves. like Atlanticella. Again, with like this sponge that's on the lower left hand corner. Uh, that also that looks a lot more like Atlanticella, that sort of wide spreading yeah, vase. Whereas the other sponges that have that similar morphology but are sort of a finer texture, you can see how it would be confusing as to try to figure out which one's which. There are some really cool organisms here today. I'm loving my sponges. 
I just can't get enough. I'm like, ooh, look at that. Ooh, look at that. This is what I would describe as a spongapalooza. So if it is a second the diversity we'll, that we're um, seeing in the types of sponges up, here is, up, is just phenomenal. It, it, we can bring the drawer back From demo sponges to glass can, uh, sponges and all of these sponges in different up. families. Yeah, I just want uh, to We're seeing a lot of euplotelid sponges and soft right sponges. Um, and we're seeing demo there. sponges, those really push large, round, uh, so when you're stable, I can bring masses of sponge, the, the sponge the with the yellow on the outside, white on the top, uh, no, ureted to sponges, out, those very fine textured sponges, encrusting demo sponges, I can't, I can't rosellid sponges, rosellid base sponges, rosellid barrel sponges. I don't think so. I'm just going to keep saying sponges. Okay. There's a bit from far scum that ready, comes I'll to mind. Yeah, bring her in. Coming up. Okay. That should be enough to grab the. Yeah. Okay. Just so we're going to attempt to suction sample uh, this sponge, which should work because it is a relatively uh, squishy sponge. Um, that some markers, co -pilot, holds up uh, relatively well, so but also can you, pull apart more like cotton candy metal. texture uh, rather than, do, uh, say, the sponge next to it, that uh, giant opening furled vase, uh, which would be a lot crunchier and break into small pieces. Yeah, and if you're not familiar with uh, Deep Discoverer, which is yeah, camera I number one if you're watching the live feed, and Sirios, which is camera number two when you're watching the live feed, the suction sampler that you can see front and center on Deep Discoverer is a relatively new addition to our observational platform. And we've gotten a lot of use out of it so far. It's been surprisingly versatile in terms of both it's probably intended use of grabbing relatively soft and fragile samples as we're doing right now. We've also used it to get some uh, fragments of rocks and other stuff that don't exactly neatly fit within the manipulator arms as well. It's a great addition to uh, the Deep Discover observational platform that lets us get video footage on every dive and also samples. Just having a look around, make sure I'm not bending anything. It's very gentle. Very gentle. Okay. And let's see. Um, they're going to hit the wall if you The color of the sponge is just great. I think it's going to produce uh, some funky colored ethanol, if I had to guess. Oh. Well, probably. Uh, More no pink story. lemonade and rather than yellow lemonade. I think the port upper definitely is... Oh, oh copy that. There's port up or back. I would just leave it. I'm not going anywhere. Okay, hydraulics. Are active. Gonna bring many up onto my screen. Thank you. I think I'm bumping into the wall here. Yeah, you are very close. You're pushing off the wall right now? Yeah. Um, 
Hang on. I think the best bet would be to. Okay, get the suction sampler going. Okay. Let's get a suction. Okay, we have some in. Okay, suction off. Suction's off. All right, it looks like we got ourselves a Active. generous helping of that sponge as Jumps well as off. some other stuff that was on there. Potentially a squat lobster that I might have seen get uh, okay. sucked up into our tube. I may be imagining that. It looked like something like that. It could have been a squat lobster. A lot of animals do uh, live inside these sponges and use them as habitat. Yeah, none of these samples that we collect uh, are associate free, generally speaking. Um, just again, the, the general impression that I get from this deep sea biology that it's like a party where okay. there's one person who comes on way. time and then just a huge number who are fashionably laid after uh, that foundational party member already party brings all me. the good snacks and stuff like that. Oh, oh thank you. Stirred up things a little bit. Okay, coming back. I uh, have moved my altitude there now. You're still using me as reference. I did. It still looks like there's something in six, though. Do you see that as well? Um, so I did test the suction before we took the sample, so, well, we have sample and bypass. Okay. Let's see here. So we're getting ourselves uh, reoriented okay. and back on track you were underneath me, after but, pushing yeah. off back uh, from rock that coming wall. Up. Uh, yep, we're see, coming back around on our tune -up swing retriever seamount see that we're ascending today. We're hoping to get about know, no. 600 meters of elevation over the course of our dive from the initial Can depth of about 2650 meters up to maybe about 2,000, 2,200 meters if we're lucky. This is not an extended yeah, dive like up. yesterday, um, so Thank we you. will have to take okay. into account the Pretty so extensive ascent and descent time them. for Deep Discover and Sirius. I did, yeah. I brought them both in. And backing up so you can see. One of the things I'm curious to see today, if we'll see today, is those really long whip bamboo corals Such that we were up. seeing yesterday. Uh, those long whips tend to be on a number of different kinds of um, yeah. I, I seamounts. So we see the, the, that the particular kind of bamboo coral on seamounts, but we haven't really seen that kind of coral um, on other features like the canyons that we were exploring. Yeah, I think I saw a pretty short bifurcated whip when we were making our initial ascent today, but definitely none of the uh, meters long twirly ones of the variety that we were seeing yesterday. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I see it. We got a bunch of chunks in the tube there. Right. Nicely done. Gotta leave it on six for now. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, I'm working up to the top of this thing. Thank you, Lord. 
Lars, thank you both for your indulgence at my unorthodox method. It looks as we keep going up this feature, we're approaching this local high uh, that is just covered with so many sponges. It also looks pretty heavily sedimented considering it's horizontal or sub-horizontal. And accordingly, looking at the yeah, color of the sponges, the it looks here. like a lot of them are dead or dying considering that they're filled with sediment. So this being a relatively flatter surface than the sheer walls that we were looking at before, um, it shouldn't be surprising that some of them yeah, I think it was are still in the tube it was being to silted push out by the, the pelagic drape. Could have pushed it in. I think we'll leave it for now. Next sample will be in jar three. And then, uh, We used to have a printout, right, of all the samples. Yeah. Did we stop doing that? Um, I believe so. Okay. We we mainly did that for the the different filters every day. And um, I so as we go so along, we I'm seeing a lot uh, of uh, really large fans. So some the of these corals so look like they're bamboo corals, and I'm seeing some pink corals. And then there's also some toppled skeletons. Yeah, and that can happen um, pretty sure easily we'll to yeah, uh, pink corals. Park They're park here, relatively you fragile. Up, these corals. Go ahead and get another move in there. Yeah, and a few yeah. of our uh, sponge yeah, cake sponges as stunning. well, which I believe we only saw one of those uh, on what do you think? our dive. 20 meters? If I recall correctly, that might have been Kinlan Canyon. Yeah, I believe yeah. it was Kinlan so Canyon yeah. that we saw that. Um, but these corals look different. On the way. Uh, I'm kind of wondering if they might be something that isn't a, a pink coral, but perhaps a scleric tinian coral. I'm not sure. It's interesting to note as well that the local community, We're as in just here. on this yeah, relatively flat ahead, area, definitely appears to be more coral dominated than sponge dominated. Now we're getting into coral land. Oh no, it is it is a pink coral. It just there was so much of it, so brambly. That's not how I'm used to seeing uh, pink corals growing. Usually, uh, they they grow in these large fans that tend to line up along features. And as we get this close view, you can look at the texture along the uh, main axis of these branches. It's not that sort of bumpy, knobbly te texture that you, you're used to seeing when we look at Paragorgia corals or bubblegum corals. And then there's a bit of the skeleton where the tissue has receded, and you can see that really beautiful uh, pink color. And so this coral is relatively fragile. So if you were to collect a piece of it, it would break easily. And say if a fish were to swim by uh, and right into this coral, it would shatter into pieces. Which is something I have observed during a dive. I'm thinking we might actually have two different uh, species of pink coral during this dive. Those big white fans and then That's this sort of smaller, um, much more pink uh, corallium. And a small outcropping of those uh, distinctive pink sponges that we just collected as well. And this area, um, as you can probably tell, is a lot more mantled with uh, 
pelagic or ambient sedimentation that you would expect to see anywhere on the seafloor at this general depth. And that shouldn't come as a surprise. This is a relatively yeah. lower slope area than ones right that we were looking at about 10 ridge, minutes so ago. I'm looking at our navigation computer right now, and the isobaths, or the lines of equal depth, are more widely spaced apart in the area that we're at than we were a minute before. So we'll this is kind of a local decrease in gradient resulting in a more gentle slope where you can get sediment accumulating instead of just sloughing off those That's really right. steep walls. That's going to take you a ways off. I might yeah. come to an easy step here. Pilot, can we get a zoom on that starfish to the lower right? Yeah. I agree. Um, What are you looking at now, uh, Lars? 298. Two, 290. 290, okay. Let me come up a little bit. You can range me out and see what uh, what uh, my sonar is seeing here. See, I think this, this ridge just keeps going up on a narrow spine here for yeah. quite some distance. I was just following the peak of it. You're at 50. I might uh, cheat you to something like 280 because we already got a north move in. If that works for you. Okay. All right, 280, 20 meters coming up. All right, I'll come back down. Meander while you guys catch up. All right, that should bring you a little... Closer there, Lars. Oh, we're drifting back around to get into focus of the slope. It looks like we're getting back into the steep and really rubbly terrain that we're seeing above. And this kind of rugose and really bumpy uh, bottom should be no problem. Should be no surprise considering that seamounts and volcanic areas generally grow uh, laterally by means of sloughing off their sides. They're generally, once they get exposed to the marine environment after ex extrusion, um, joints start to appear and form and pieces slough off. also interesting. Oh, I think we have a sea star feeding yep. on a coral. Yeah, we do. I was going to say something else, but then, oh, sea star. I don't quite have the tether to get to it. We'll just uh, take a long shot at it here. We can zoom video. Well, that's okay. We can look at some of this other stuff. Yeah, let's just hold that right there. and I'll Let's take a look at the around. sponge that's growing on a coral. Ah, okay. <laughs> that's crazy. Why Oops. Why is there sponge growing on coral? Maybe it came loose and just got hung up there. Yeah, I'm at the end of my tether, so I'm going to just, I'm bouncing around a bit here. Let's let her float. Well, in any case, it doesn't matter what we look at. There is some really cool stuff here. Um, we're seeing some bamboo coral some more of those really large uh, vases. Um, this sort of the pink coral, uh, Scott France in the chat said that uh, it could be Corallium niobe, or no, uh, no, he said Corallium bathyrubrum, and then the large white fans could be Corallium niobe, which is a white morph, has a white morph and has been seen in the Northeast Seamounts. Is that a sponge growing within a sponge? Yes, it's sponge -ception. So this is a dead sponge with a live sponge is on it. Which isn't unheard of. We have seen uh, sponges growing on dead sponges and we've seen corals growing on dead corals. And here I think it looks like uh, real estate is at a premium. Everybody's vying for their space and everything seems to be growing on everything else. Uh, this is a really dense uh, deep sea coral and sponge community. And 
Sometimes it's hard to see where the corals start and the sponges begin and vice versa. Hey, Megan, this is Chris Ma. Hey, Chris. Hey, I caught that brief mention or shot of uh, that sea star feeding on a coral, and uh, I wasn't sure if you were getting back to it, but um, I recognized it uh, just from the surface that we saw. Uh, that's uh, Eoplosoma. That's like the number one sea star predator of coral. Um, and I described a species of Eoplosoma uh, from uh, bare seamount, uh, oh, a couple of years ago uh, after it was named for Les Watling, actually, um, Eoplosoma watlingi. Uh, this, the, I, we didn't get a look at it really closely, the one that, that was here, but I suspect that it's probably uh, Eoplosoma watlingi. Um, since, you know, just because it, it sort of looks like the one, oh, there we go. Yeah, that, that sort of looks like the one that I described from, oh, I think it was 20, 2010 or 2011, when something like that. The Evil Plasoma is a fairly widespread genus of uh, sea star, and as you know, it's a, it's a really well-associated species with, with a lot of these corals. Um, they extrude their stomach onto the tissue and digest them. Uh, usually they are fond of isidids, uh, bamboo corals, and um, I'm not quite sure why or if that's a, like a specific preference or if that's a, uh, just they're attracted to them because, because they have the most nutritive tissue to digest or, um, or if there's some other reason, there are still a lot of mysteries and you've, commented on several occasions, uh, both you and Jeff have commented about how uh, a lot of times these observations are literally just our first stab in the dark as far as understanding the ecology and the biology of these things. And, and where these sea stars are concerned, it's certainly the case because a lot of times we're just now observing them for the first time feeding, and it's uh, not unusual to see them doing something that we really didn't expect them to be doing. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and uh, there are a lot of times when I see a lot of these dead coral colonies and they're denuded, you know, the, the tissue has been completely removed, usually, you know, from the bottom. And, and I wonder if maybe a sea star had been, had been responsible for that. And, um, and there are a couple of papers I was just reading about how sea stars contribute to, to the reduction of uh, certain sponge and sponge communities in, in certain areas, and and so in shallow water, and so you know it could be that even one sea star could could have a meaningful impact on the ecology of these animals in terms of their physical presence in an area. So this one could be, it might, you know, it might move very slowly by our standards, but it it could be feeding on on these corals for you know years, if not longer. So and and have a an impact on the community structure. You know which ones are are older, younger, faster growing, et cetera, relative to you know uh, a number of of variable factors. So um, every observation that that you guys make with a sea star present to me has incredible value. So I appreciate it. Well, we appreciate you calling in and telling us all about this really cool sea star fitting on a bamboo coral. Just come wide, please, Peter. Well, always a pleasure to call in and hear your both of your entertaining narratives. So, and it's a great sight today. So, uh, hopefully, there will be another uh, starfish to look at soon. Well, if I was a starfish that fed on corals, this would be a great place to be. <laughs> well. I get the impression that if I hung on long enough, something else would show up eventually because uh, the sponges here are definitely uh, Sarah Master Chow, and um, I would be surprised if we didn't see a Goniaster in the next 15 or 20 minutes. So anyway, I'll let you get back to it. Um, watch me call back in like two minutes as soon as I hang up. That's another fun <laughs> part of this. Thank you. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Chris. Bye-bye. Bye. Starting to get a little bit out there, pilot. Okay. Should be catching up here shortly.
Yeah, it looks like this sponge move. or sponge-like thing in front and center right now might be one that we haven't seen yet today. It looks a lot denser and uh, consolidated than the other ones. I don't know if that might just be an optical illusion just given how far it is away from Deep Discover right now. Let's uh, zoom a little bit video, zero in on it. Where, yeah. uh, where away there, Jeff? Um, uh, to the upper right. Upper right. Relative to, I'm driving the lasers. Yeah, now, Talk me in. now center, center top. Center top, uh, coming up in you the background. To, yeah, you to pilot? Okay. you're coming you're up on it right now. That thing? What was your last move? Yeah, there that we go. That little bit, okay. It was 20. We might be able to get a to the left here? right now. To yeah, top I'm left. just uh, looking whether I could put a toe down and get okay. you tight. Yeah, what is it? Here. Yeah. Kind of looks like a bunch of grapes. Yeah, so we're trying to uh, stabilize ourselves right now um, in this current. And uh, it looks like in the background, again, is some kind of denser sponge that we're trying to get a little closer to get a look at. Um, Megan has uh, stepped out to lunch during these long dives. We have to obey our own personal biology. So I will not be able to provide any sort of useful information More in terms of what the sponge is, zoom. but I will do my best to describe it given what I've learned so far. Oh, wow, this is one uh, that, that I wasn't even looking at. It's really interesting looking. It's got a lot of ruffles within it. Uh, it kind of looks to me like kind of a hop plant if you've ever seen that before. And I have to guess that this really dense clustered uh, arrangement is beneficial in terms of surface area for filtering the water. But this is definitely a morphology of sponge that we haven't seen so far. Uh, that should be enough for good, yeah. Max, max it out here and we'll, they can clip it out for later review. Yeah, and you can see even with uh, our maximum zoom that we have right now that the spicules or the skeleton of the sponge are even a little too fine for our camera resolution to resolve. And that makes sense considering that the body of sponge has so much structure to it. This would probably be one where I would imagine to get a really good look at the spicules, you would want something like a hand lens or a microscope. Okay, we can come wide. Pilot, can we do a kind of pirouette around that uh, grape-looking sponge that we were just looking at to look at the backside? Sure. Yeah, um, Scott France, our OER science uh, program advisor on land and deep sea sponge and coral expert, was just saying that the we were probably looking at the back of a sponge that might be familiar from the other side. Uh, I would not be familiar with the back or front of a sponge uh, <laughs> even just based on that orientation, but uh, the best guess from Scott is possibly a Faria and says that it is probably growing from a stalk. We've seen a couple of those other uh, stalked sponges so far on this expedition. We haven't gotten a close look from one. It was interesting to see the stalked ones because they were anchored to soft sediment substrate or little pebbles covered in sediment when we last saw them, when this is most definitively hard ground that they're anchored directly into. Yeah, I see, what, I see what he wanted to see. How am I doing on that? Rock. 
Okay, I've just got a toe down. I can get the shot here. Video, let's zoom. Yeah, there's the there's definitely another side to it. Huh? Yeah. Okay. That was a uh, a good a steer tighter. from Scott France on land to look at this. Now we can see uh, kind of the ruffles, and it does it does look more familiar at this orientation. Looking at it, um, hard to tell if there is a stalk at the base of it, just given the, the overwhelming density of what looks like a bunch of different types of corals and sponges that I'm. Uh, sure, yeah, somebody you, on land knows what they are um, that we're looking at right now. Um, but yeah, definitely more of a lettuce -y looking sponge than the uh, clustery grape leaves that we were seeing before. And it looked like a small juvenile fish that we're looking at seeing above. This looks pretty similar, a larger specimen um, that we saw on a previous dive. I can't recall the common name or the scientific name of what it was it was some sort of benthic fish one of those large mouthed uh, creatures that lives close to the bottom and seems to conserve its energy and wait to ambush um, but that one was definitely a familiar sight uh, pilot can we look at that sponge to the lower right right now um, lower right uh, dead one uh, no not dead uh, bright white um, right, now it's center right, uh, actually. There's two specimens of it. Ah, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hang on. Really, really dense looking. Doesn't look translucent. It looks like a, a real solid off-white. There's Dead. one coming into the center right, and there's one to top right right now. Either one of those. the lasers, or tell me uh, which way to move the lasers. All the way to the, your right side of the screen. Right side of the screen. Oh, that big thing. Uh, that's uh, okay. Yeah, it's just about center screen right now. That's okay. the one. All right, let's do a quick zoom on that. Thanks. Yeah, this one kind of caught my eye just in terms of how uh, dense it looks. This looks like the spongiest sponge, if I will, that we've seen on this dive today. And uh, if we can get to a more solid ground and take a closer look at it, I suspect that the density of the spicules or its internal structure will be a lot more closely knit than the ones that we saw before. So, yeah, we can uh, find a parking spot here. Let's come wide video. So go over your starboard's pretty clear. Yeah, I just don't want to mash anything. There's coral right under me, right here. Let's pirouette around. As Megan was saying a little bit ago, the orientation of these spicules or the skeleton of the sponge kind of determines. Um, its body consistency and the ones that had the more sparsely interweaved will probably be more of a crunchy or a fragile one well this one again to me just looks a lot more woolly And this one is really reminiscent superficially as well of, uh, I cannot remember whether those are stalactites or stalagmites on a cave ground. And uh, Scott France on land is saying it's just not a sponge that he recognizes. Um, if that's the case, I Headlights. we're not sure whether we'll see this one again. It's entirely possible. But I think I'm going to go ahead and make a unilateral decision to make a collection on this one if it's one that Scott doesn't recognize. Video, let's have a zoom. So I still think you're swinging, co-pilot. I'd like to maybe bring you back 10 Did meters. you copy that, pilot? Copy that. Uh, yes, I heard that. We're, we're getting organized here. Yeah, awesome, thank you. Okay. And we'll stand by for uh, your call. Video, we need a zoom. If I had to guess, this one should be a little less fragile than the one before and should kind of stay together. I imagine it probably has kind of a fluffy or woolly texture. Okay. And it looks like there's a, on the back side of it, one of those uh, crinoids, I believe they're called, that we saw. Um, yesterday a lot um, and again you can see just the there are a 
huge number of individual osculums or openings on the sponge that allows water uh, laden with food that the sponge relies on to pass through it. Um, Pilot, can we get a zoom of the base as well before yes, we sample it? Sure can. We'll come back in video. And another interesting thing about this now that we're zooming in on the base is it looks like it's holdfast or where it's attached from is fairly wide and composed of a pretty large number of individual tendrils. So it's an open question whether it kind of just grows those as needed for support as the sponge grows larger or whether it just has a wide base to begin with. This is a cool looking one. It's very, it looks very robust uh, compared to a lot of the more wispy or ethereal sponges that we've been seeing yeah, so far on this dive. This, the, uh, yeah. this is going to be by far the most number of times that I've said sponge in a short amount of time in my life. Good. Well, I'm going to take the mini up under my All right. We're just getting some good thorough video footage of the sponge before moving out to collect it. The largest advantage to my mind of this method of ocean exploration is being able to collect both data in situ, as in coming to the organism or the particular geological formations uh, native habitat and documenting it there as well as getting physical samples. And as Scott, this, as Scott noted, it looks like there are also some small polyps growing along that lower margin of the sponge along the base of its holdfast, which is interesting. How much of this do we want? Uh, I don't think we need too much. You can just grab one of those top uh, little pieces and that would probably be fine. Okay. You were spun up and ready to go, pilot. Thank you, Lars. Why don't you max out your down rotation on your... Yeah, I'm serious. Yeah, so bear with us as we get uh, uh, oh, squared up yeah. for sampling. I believe this is going to be a manipulator arm job, so we'll need to extend the sampling tray of Deep Discoverer and then bring forth one of these manipulator arms that you can see coming into your picture right now uh, to just pluck a small subsample of the sponge for identifying genetic and cataloging purposes. Where's my knife? Way past it. You might have to come up a little bit, co pilot. Your slant range is ten. Lock. All right, Which that's a uh, that's a clean cut across uh, the top uh, of that side sponge. Would be more convenient. Cover that. Ready for the drawer? Ready for drawer. Coming up. Might bump there on the port side. That's okay. okay push. It might push you out a little. That's okay.
Okay, hold in there. I'll come down one minute. Okay, I'm looking at the port side. Was in Dura. Pilot confirm that was port inboard uh, bio box. I can confirm that. Thank port you. Inner. Okay. Yeah. So we just gave that uh, sponge a nice you keep haircut coming up there, uh, to take as a sample, considering that. Uh, Scott France, who has pretty extensive experience on these uh, New England seamounts, uh, numerous campaigns of uh, dives and Thanks. trawls and yeah. such, and didn't recognize it. I think that makes it a good candidate for collection, and uh, hope we can figure something out about it. Hydraulics off. It looks like the shoulder's down. Why? Why? But I'll get it up. Copy bridge zero seven zero. Thanks. Uh, hydraulics ramp down. Oh, that's all right. Cool. You should be all right. I'm trying to get. Oh, shoulder is all the way up. Just looks funny. Hydraulics off. Thank you, Lars. Okay, if you want to come up and push Yeah, I'll get out, uh, get back where, uh, where it looks better. And it looks like there's at least one more specimen of this sponge that we can see in our lower right right now. We're ascending up and getting back off the seabed to continue our exploration of Retriever Seamount. Yeah. This is dive number nine rock. of EX-1905 Like 2, the Deep Connections off, Cruise, please. in which we are focusing on submarine canyons That's and seamounts right. in a transboundary expedition starting in Canadian waters and transiting into oh, U.S. waters. Like you need to pull up. We are well into the U.S. leg of our oh, cruise, and we have moved from submarine canyons to seamounts. We are currently on Retriever Seamount. Yeah. Uh, this is probably going to be our forward. deepest benthic dive of the expedition. We made bottom at about 2650 meters, and we are currently about 2580 sure meters of water depth. Yeah. And I'll Since we landed, it's just been there. pretty uniformly really steep volcanic it's igneous terrain of the walls of the seamount as well as talus fields at the base of it and just uniformly encrusted by a enormous variety and volume of sponges. Sponges as far as the eye can see. Okay, holding there. Interspersed with a number of corals as well I that we've been okay. trying to document as well. Conspicuously absent, except for possibly a couple small samples, have been the really elongated whip like bamboo corals that we were seeing at Bear Seamount yesterday. And I could think of a huge variety of reasons why 
those whip bamboo carls could be absent from this. Could be geographic distance, meaning that that particular uh, variety, I be, believe clade is the term, hasn't settled on Retriever Seamount. Could be a preferred depth range. We're diving deeper than we were yesterday. Uh, could be a number of things. But really prevalent in this area has been this kind of what we were calling sponge cake sponge. The uh, yellow sponges with the white interiors that you're probably seeing numerously across the field of vision right now that may or may not be two separate sponges uh, living together. I don't know if... Hi Jeff, it's uh, Scott France here and uh, you just made a really interesting point. I, I don't know why I didn't make this observation myself but about the bamboo corals and I just had a look in my database and sure enough uh, we have not collected those um, tall bamboo whips on Retriever Seamount. And so that suggests to me that we didn't actually see them here because um, the expedition that we were doing, we were trying to get samples of as many species from as many different seamounts as possible to do the sort of population genetic connectivity. Um, so that's a fascinating observation. There are bamboo corals on Retriever. Uh, the ones that we saw and collected, according to my notes here, uh, were quite small, uh, bramble-like, or the Achenella bush type. Um, so if we see any of those uh, bigger ones, that'll definitely be something to take a note of. Yeah, yeah, thanks for, thanks for confirming that, Scott. Notice. I believe that yeah, I here. saw, unless my eyes deceive me, one small bifurcated whip uh, on this dive so far. I, I, I'll have to go back and confirm that. But definitely yeah, none of the I really elongated ones. ones as well. In fact, uh, just when you were collecting the sponge, I noticed behind it that there was a small colony that had this really interesting, um, what you might think is a random pattern of growth, where it seemed to grow upright from the substrate for about three or four inches, and then it almost takes like a right-hand turn, uh, 90 degrees, and then continues to grow upward. And we saw that repeatedly on this cruise we just came back from from the North Pacific, and we decided that must be an actual growth pattern for a particular species. So it was really cool to see there. Uh, one other thing I wanted to note, uh, when I first turned tuned in there about 30 minutes ago, you were in this dense patch of the pink um, coral leaves, the precious corals. <coughs> Pardon me, like the one we're seeing right here below the sponge. Sorry, hang on. Sorry about that. No worries. Um, and I was going to say that we saw a very similar thing at 2,500 meters on some of the New England steam mounts further to the east. And we had made the determination that those coralleids were most abundant in areas where the currents were the strongest and the microtopography was channeling flow. And, um, you know, that might explain why you saw so many um, here just a short time ago. Maybe the currents are really strong. Yeah, thanks for that observation, Scott, and I can definitely empirically confirm that the currents are fairly vigorous down here. It was more apparent when we first made bottom and we had more of the water column to look through. We could just see by particulate movement that it looked like it was moving at, if I had to eyeball it, about 50 centimeters or a half meter per second speed, which is relatively robust current uh, for this environment. Um, another... Uh, Sorry. Um, you just passed over a Parantopathy's black coral, and I don't. Yesterday we were talking about them, and um, I think Megan had noted you hadn't seen any. So I just wanted to make a note of it. The bottle brush thing that's in the center of the screen there just came back. Yeah. Hey, pilot, do you mind uh, zooming in on that bottle brush looking uh, yeah. coral to the lower middle? Yeah. Uh... I'm just saying, in case you haven't observed them yet today, um, I don't think we saw any yesterday. Uh, so this would be a new addition to the diversity. Uh, for the expedition, and very often when we see these, there are um, a pair of squat lobsters that live on them, a male and a female, so it'll be interesting to look for those as well. Video, we can, oops, no, we can't see, hang on. Hey, Scott, while I've got you here, uh, those really curly whip bamboo corals, okay, do you happen to know if those are found to seamounts to the southeast of Retriever? Um, as near as I can tell from my database, they are not on Retriever. Okay. Uh, 
Um, I have so no record of any of those bamboo corals on Retriever, and I don't recall the earlier um, Okeanos Explorer dives on the other side of Retriever. I'd have to check that out. So now that we've zoomed in, this is not a black coral at all. This is actually a Chrysogorgia, um, uh, one of the members of the uh, the golden corals, the Chrysogorgiaidae. Um, you know, have these very Again, delicate zoom. branches with There's these pink polyps that almost seem there. perched on them like birds on a wire. Yes, and um, very characteristic and geometric pattern to the branching. If you were sort of to be able to clear through all the polyps that are in the way, you'd see the main axis almost looks um, twisted or bent. It's kind of uh, rotating around its axis and then putting out branches at a very regular interval such that we can count the number of branches or the number of rotations it takes to have one branch come directly above another, and that's one of the ways they use to um, describe and identify these things. Yeah, I think I can see that twist now at the end, now that you mention it. Um, the other thing is uh, you can see the polyps themselves appear swollen and sort of uh, white in color. I think they're probably packed with, uh, with gametes, either eggs or sperm bundles um, Thanks, Bridge. right now. Can good come good right reproductive now. state. Whole thing. Yeah, and it's good. also notable, I don't think I've seen any of these uh, Chrysogorgid, I believe you, you said it is, without the uh, little red either amphipods or isopods, I can never tell them apart, uh, also living along the branches. Yep, usually um, amphipods, and very often you find some shrimp in there, and the shrimp kind of hang out and um, the Chrysogorgia colonies yeah, also when they're the reproductive, light. so the female will be carrying eggs, and it seems like it's a good place for protection. This is a pretty good indication of the current right there, the way that thing is sort of blowing in the wind. Yeah, um, yeah that seems to be another uh, pretty common association. It's interesting. What, so what about just to, the, just to the left of that yellow sponge? Sorry, I know you're zooming out. Can you just zoom back in quickly? Uh, sure. A pilot, could we get a zoom on that other bottle brush one just to the lower left of one of those uh, volleyball sponges, the yellow and uh, white ones? Yeah, Pilots sorry, are uh, doing a delay. change right now, so <laughs> the phone in the video. Uh, I think you'd already away from they it. were passing off the headset. You might have to say that again, Jeff. Yeah, uh, sorry, Scott. We're undergoing a shift change right now, so. No problem. There's lots to look at here. Yeah, so as I said, we are undergoing a ROV team shift change right now, which is why we are drifting away from the rock. We will get ourselves reoriented in a minute. But it's just nice to take a step back and just look at the incredible volume and diversity of sponges and corals that we've seen so far on this dot. Okay, watch lead. Was there a subject you wanted me to zoom in on in the field of view? Uh, yeah, I don't exactly, oh, I think I remember where it is. Uh, top, middle, right above that shelf-like sponge, there's one of those little volleyball sponges, uh, white with uh, yellow around most of it, and there's going to be another one of those little bottle brush things to the left of it, immediate left, and if you could zoom on the bottle brush thing, that would be great. Is it coming center? Yep, you got okay. it. All right. Lasers are almost on it. All right. Yeah, so we're going to look at another one of these bottle brushes. Uh, initially, I did as a black coral when we zoomed in, we saw it was instead a chrysogorgid. Yeah, more specifically, the genus Chrysogorgia. This one just looked a little bit different from, from a distance, but maybe I'm fooled again. Okay, maybe it's come another, in another one with slightly different color. Okay. Yeah, it's looking more and more Chrysogorgia like as we get closer. Yep, it is. So um, you, you don't have to image it or image it as you please, but that's the ID. Thanks. Okay, we don't need a deep zoom on this. We just got an okay. ID. Understood. 
Hey, Scott, have you had any more you thoughts about uh, these sponges that we're seeing right now that we sampled uh, in one of the canyons in the earlier dive, whether those Pilots, uh, that's uh, one sponge or whether it's one sponge stop. overgrowing the other one? Yeah, um, I haven't, Jeff. You know, I, I think it's two sponges. I think it's a yellow sponge overgrowing a white one, but I'd love to be proved wrong, so I'm really glad that we got a piece of it. If it is one sponge, what it means is... Um, and, uh, you know, there's so many of them around here, it, also that's making me think it is, is one east, sponge. East, uh, but it means that the sponge is able to control the texture and color of its growth. Water. It really looked like the texture was very different when we got that close-up view of it when we were doing the, the, size uh, of this one. the collection. Absolutely, and, and Megan confirmed that on board when she was uh, preparing the sample that the texture of the inside, I believe, was a very unpleasant fiberglass-like feeling. It sure was. Right. It definitely stabbed me through my glove. Yeah, and so that means there's different spicules that are arranged on the interior and the exterior, different color, different pattern to laying them down, and certainly that's all possible, but, you know, that's a pretty complex growth form uh, for that sponge. But I guess the fact that we're seeing so many of them and the yellow only seems to be associated with that sort of white ball or bowl, maybe they are the same thing. Yeah, that was I'm my original to see, thought, uh, too. You told me you preserve separate, right? You can do yes. genetics on them separately, the yellow and the white. Yeah, I try to just take bits of the yellow uh, parts of the sponge and preserve that in ge uh, for genetics, and then uh, pieces of the inside, also so they're definitely talking, separate. Uh, uh, but two, the whole, it would be now. impossible so to separate are, that uh, yellow uh, outer crust from the inside part yeah. of the sponge oh. uh, to preserve them in ethanol separately as separate specimens just because it's almost it, it's it looks like it grew that way it yeah. you know i know that we had been speculating about uh, it feature. being two separate yeah. sponges but like especially with how many of them we're seeing yeah. it seems like uh it would have to Could it's always the same sponge with always the same yellow outside uh, it would be strange to always have the Come two the, separate sponges yeah, always down. on each other. Just a couple meters. Right? Right. And so I agree. But we know that, that that's not impossible. You know, we see the um, metallogorgia opioprius relationship. You've always got the same species of ophiroid associated with that coral. We know that, that sort of relationship is possible. Um, but, yeah, maybe it's unusual. But I'm certainly excited to find out in the months to come um, what's the deal with that sponge. Sponges. Yeah, yeah I'm excited to learn more about it too. Want to go to 30 or 20? How about 20? This is just an amazing community yeah, on on this basalt wall. So this is all igneous rock. Like um, steep walls. Yeah. As our geologists would tell us, uh, that has been coated uh, in a manganese rind, which slowly accumulates over. Uh, many, many years, so in some cases, millions of years. And the thickness of that rind can tell us a little bit about how old the rock actually is. So Scott, um, I was talking a little bit earlier about how at these deeper depths we seem to see a lot more sponges in comparison to the, the corals. Have you seen that association as well? This is cool. Yeah, port surround. Yeah, it's fine. It's a cool wall. I know. It's awesome. Well, actually, we're going to continue kind of going zigzagging our way up this. If you want us to zoom in on anything, just let us know. That sounds good. Thank you. Gonna rotate down for a moment, pilot. Copy.
So if you're just joining us, at, welcome uh, to Retriever Seamount. This is Dive 9 of the uh, Deep Connections 2019 sample, Expedition, exploring sample, canyons and seamounts and along the Northeast Atlantic. This seamount, Retriever Seamount, is one of four seamounts, part of the Northeast Canyons and Seamounts Marine National Monument, which is really exciting to see um, how dense and diverse this community here is on Retriever Seamount. It really reiterates how much of a special place uh, these seamounts can be. And uh, they're a really great place for science because there is no commercial activity in this area. These areas are protected from that. Uh, it's a great place to do science. And uh, within the monument, we can do these surveys and explorations. This is the first time we've ever seen this seamount on this side uh, and seeing these uh, really amazing uh, sponge communities and coral communities here. And this survey is really going to help us learn uh, how these areas of our ocean are connected and a little bit more about the range and diversity of the community uh, at these depths. In addition, the marine monuments really help scientists who are studying the impacts of human activity on our oceans by comparing these relatively pristine areas of the ocean. So they're like living laboratories for our explorations. Oh, I'm thinking we're seeing a new sponge. Um, Pilot, can you zoom in on that stocked sponge? Reminds me of a bull soma. Some of my favorites. I was totally going to say it's one of my favorites. This is the sponge that if I could like make a sponge lamp, this would be it. Uh, this sponge is known as Saca calyx. It's a type of euplectelid sponge uh, that has a very long stalk. It's and it's pretty characteristic by its uh, very uh, bubbly looking outside. And at the top, as we look down into it, you can see the openings stock. and the holes of the osculum. Stock sponge, yeah. And I just always imagine this sponge as like a nice floor lamp. And sometimes the head of this sponge can get really wide and frilly. And they're absolutely beautiful. Uh, I'm gonna try to so this is a Sacacalyx glass sponge. We can do it floating, I guess. Yeah. And it's also the first Sacacalyx I've seen so far. One more sponge for sponge diversity. Sure. Do you want me to pull in the starboard swinger? Yeah. yeah. Sure. So now that we're zooming closer, you can see that surface texture along the outside of this sponge. It, it looks knobbly and has a lot of surface area. And you can see all those small little holes. And all those holes are really important to the sponge for uh, bringing water into the sponge we'll skeleton and uh, bringing uh, both water and food particles yeah, to bit. the cells of this sponge so that they can feed. And next to the sponge in the background is a nice, really cool anemone uh, with the rounded bulbs at the I'm ends sure of its tentacles. That anemone on is an actinostolidae, uh, uh, so an enemy, yeah, an enemy yeah. no, in the be, be uh, family actinostolidae. Okay. Yeah. All right, you come Also up. seeing a tube uh, anemone in the wall, along with a number of different encrusting demo sponges uh, that are just like spotting all of the rock the faces that we're looking on. at. Thanks, video. Thanks. There's also this really uh, big dead piece of coral skeleton. And, 
and it looks sort of brown. So I'm curious as to what coral that might have come from. It would It's hard to tell right okay, now I'm because it is a, a dead piece of skeleton. Um, Sorry, was that but perhaps as we move along oh, our yeah. dive Bring track today, we will <laughs> see more corals that are large and might give us a sense as to what that coral might have been. So every time we do a dive, I'm always impressed with just how breathtaking some of these landscapes can be, or seascapes, if you were. Uh, we're always finding something new or unexpected in every dive, and that's what makes this a really great tool. And what's so great about the Okeanos and our program here is we're here to explore. No one's ever seen this before. And sometimes we know exactly what something is, but what's the most exciting for me and for a lot of people is that these explorations bring so many questions and so many new things. And I keep seeing this association of uh, what appears to be a dead coral skeleton with a type of sponge growing over it. Uh, that's definitely a new one for my book. I have seen sponges growing on other sponges, and I have seen uh, a sponge stalk being colonized by another sponge growing uh, out of the stalk, but, but this sponge just sort of almost fully encrusting this coral skeleton is very interesting. Maybe we can dub this Mountain of the Weird. It's a beautiful sponge garden with many corals and sponges of all different types and sizes and shapes and colors. And the more you look, the more you see. Pilot, can we get a snap zoom on that yellow coral that's just uh, about center screen near, closer to the top, between those two yellow sponges? Is it right in the center right now? Yes, right in the center. Okay, yeah. Video, come in. I think I'm looking at the right one here. Yes, that's the right one. Okay. Uh, coral, I think. yellow, kind of coming at us. It looks like yeah, it in. might be a stoloniferous coral, a coral that grows on top of other corals. We're seeing these long trailing lines of polyps across the rock and then up onto uh, this coral skeleton. And then there's also trails of these polyps across some of the sponges as well. So right. now it's not just sponges on corals, it's corals on sponges. This looks like prime real estate here in the deep sea. Every surface area is covered with something. Corals, sponges, anemones, zoanthids. Copy. Yes. Yeah, just, just try to try to get your steady shot here. Okay, you could probably come out. Yeah.
Pilot, can we also look at that sort of helmet-shaped sponge that is just above that yellow one with the coral all over it? Oh, right here? Yeah, it's center screen. Copy. Stay by one video. So the interesting about thing about this sponge, I was trying to figure out what it was, and what I'm looking for is the uh, where it attaches to the rock. I'm not sure if it's a demo sponge that, uh, or a glass sponge. Copy. The light bar. Is that okay, Pilot? Yeah. You come in. You can come in. Zoom in if you yeah. Hmm. Zoom in more. Yeah, I think I need a little bit further. Try to see where it attaches to the rock. It might be obscured. Or attaches to whatever I guess it is. This could be a type of sponge known as polyopagon. Or it could be a demo sponge. Uh, but I'm not seeing the uh, fibrous connection that polyopagon usually has to the rock. Uh, perhaps as we go on along our transect today, we'll see more of these sponges and be able to get a better look at the base. But we are seeing some really neat anemones and hydrozoans. Yeah. Thank you, pilot. Yep. Copy. All right. Take it off. Come on, a stern. So many big colonies to dodge today. Look at it's so cool. There's the encrusted one. I'm going to rotate down and then rotate to the left. Uh, take a look at the tether real quick. Okay. Yeah, now that I've made my return from Did Taco really Tuesday, quiet, which we have every day on the boat, I believe right Taco now. Tuesday extends yeah, to the US quiet. EEZ, Exclusive Economic Zone, as oh. well as on land. Um, They're going to do a live event. It looks like another one of those really dense, uh, clustery sponges interspersed with cool. another thing, you know, I'm going to trust that Megan has wow. talked a little bit about That's that cool. to a much greater capacity than That's I can. Fair. You can probably turn those forward lights off. Be ready video. Off? Yeah. Coming off. Is it better? Less backscatter. Oh, they turned the AC up probably for the live event, maybe. Yeah, they got the mics close to the... Yeah. Yeah, this is a uh, really uh, spectacular density of sponges and corals along the walls here of Retriever Seamount. And I'm really going to have to ask uh, somebody hey, back on land, right on one of our shore-based geological Thanks. scientists who has a little bit more of a volcanology background than I do, what the deal is with these uh, this igneous material that we're seeing that appears a lot different from what we were looking at yesterday, where it's got those lighter blue-gray modeling areas in between the predominantly darker, um, presumably smaller crystal matrix of the rocks. I don't recall seeing that yesterday on our dive at Bear Seamount. Bear Seamount is the oldest seamount in the New England seamount chain, the one to the northwest that we dove on yesterday. That one is approximately 100 million years of age. Retriever is slightly younger than that, and that shows up morphologically as well. If you look at the overall shape of Retriever Seamount, wow. it's actually got a defined uh, cool cone colors. and a tip to it when Bear Seamount okay. has been eroded down to a uh, to guillot, or a flat-topped, uh, what looks like a submarine mesa, you might call it. 
It's amazing how much is down there. Huh? So okay. even though retriever yeah. is younger than bear, younger is a relative term that we're using here, as both of these features are 100 or, you know, 80, I think, I think around 80 or 90 million years old. So both of these might have been above sea level when they were formed. I don't know the specifics on that, but a combination of wave erosion and thermal subsidence has resulted in them inevitably being much deeper than their depth when they were actively building with the hot spot right underneath them. And it looks like we're seeing right now a few sponges of the variety that we saw yesterday, which kind of have those uh, really small osculums and uh, round shaped bodies, different from the yellow and white variety that we were commenting on earlier in the dive might be two different sponge species that you can see to the lower right of your screen right now. Watch your starboard toe. Copy. Got a big colony <laughs> right below you. Oh, yeah. Those sponges remind me a lot more uh, superficially of puffball mushrooms that you see on land. How old are these? It's, on, it's actually like, it's hard to know the growth rates, I guess. Yeah. But I think it's pretty slow. These, these, I don't believe I've seen anything like them before. They look like kind of a hybrid between the fluffier looking sponges that we were seeing earlier and the vases. They look like the vases, but much more as a analogy I've used before, pool noodley otherwise. And if you happen to hear voices in the background, we are doing a live interaction aboard the Okeanos Explorer with an aquarium, I believe, in New England. So. If you happen to hear any crosstalk, uh, that's what that would be. Okay, looks like the tether's getting a little taut. Time for a short move. Do you want to? Yeah, I was going to ask if you wanted a short move in. Yeah. It's pretty steep still, so. So. Ten meters in or something. Fifteen. Yeah, it you're me pretty close. You're at 25 out right now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I could be 10 meters off, but we're, we're pilot. Can we get a zoom of that uh, strand-like uh, coral? Absolutely. What the last or maybe it's a sponge. Was. Yeah, I'll get us close, and we'll get a zoom in on it. Yeah, we're gonna take a look move. at this uh, strand-like yeah, that I kind of even confidently two, identify three, two. whether it is a two, three, sponge two. or a coral yeah, from this distance right or just the fact that you know, I don't have the expertise to do that. It's interesting, the body plan looks okay. similar to a lot of the corals we'll that, that we see around here, but it just Pilot, looks ruffly in the way that a sponge is. And I think as we get closer, Bridge now. we're, yeah, you ready for we're definitely I'm definitely meters, queuing zero, in more on a sponge, two, two, and it actually looks pretty similar to zero decimal two the one that we had seen earlier that we got a look at the front and back of it that looked kind of like a cluster Roger of grapes that. from Thank the you. back. This Thank is the front that we're looking at, which has a lot more yeah. of a ruffled appearance. <laughs> Biddy, if you wanted to come in yeah, a little bit, like I'm not sure if you're busy. But. You're still about 25 meters out, right? Hey, hold that. <laughs> uh, uh, hold. I think Copy. I'm cliff. How much? Ten We're going to perch and try to get a uh, right yeah. edge, little bit of a stable yeah. platform yeah, so we can look at the uh, uh, spicule yeah. structure of the sponge. Hold on. I didn't think to ask you. We could have done it at point one. That would have been a good idea. Yeah. Uh, problem is we won't see it for a few minutes. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll try to hold that for a minute, video.
There we go. So this is a look at this uh, definitely a sponge drifting in the current. You can see in the background a couple what looks like an enemies or a cup carls. I'm not exactly sure. But the body plan, the the dead tip off. I'm sure you've heard a lot of Megan talking about the very fine scale differences between uh, different species of corals and different species of sponges. Just to step back a second and talk about just the fundamental difference between corals and sponges is that these are oh, just let it blow in the wind for a minute. both generally filter feeders. They both uh, res rely on currents to passively bring their food to them, but corals have nematocysts or stinging cells and little tentacles to do that uh, individual polyps on them Braves while sponges seen. have a much more rudimentary body complete. plan polyps. that just kind of functions exactly like a, a sieve and a filter to remove individual food particles from the water as they drift through copy Yeah. And take it off. Thanks. Co pilot will be able to watch her swing. Um, right now, the telemetries are about 12 to 13 meters apart. So, just using those as a reference. The telemetries? Uh, the topology, sorry. Oh. Yeah, topology lines. I said that oh, all wrong. Topo. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. yeah, these are some really contours. elaborate, huge, roughly yeah, sponges contours. of the variety that we've seen uh, during the dive. Pilot, can we get lasers real fast? Yeah. Yeah, so these are our scale lasers right here. They're 10 centimeters apart. So these really extravagantly large specimens, this one to the left appears to be dead or dying, is well in excess of a meter in size. Can we get a zoom of the fringe of this sponge? Yeah, looks like he's got some something growing on it. Stand by. Yeah, no, we're, we're, we're going to settle down to take a little bit of a, a zoom on this dead sponge, uh, this really elaborate roughly one, because it appears to have some sort of polyps or uh, corals growing along the fringe of it. Come in. Yeah, this is really interesting. Wow, it looks like uh, I don't... Uh, I'm going to wildly speculate and say that this might be one of the parasitic types of corals that Megan has told me about that uses the body yeah. of another coral oh, usually for structure. and Because in this case, yeah. it doesn't look like the branches the of a coral that we've coral. seen before. It looks like it's the polyps are growing on the, directly yeah, on the body of the sponge here, maybe. Uh, and using that as its substrate instead. Oh. This is really interesting, uh, interesting behavior. So you can see just kind of the skin of it uh, extending out over, and then they have their little polyps extended into the current to collect food. Yep, um, yep. But it's, it's really interesting. This looks like what you might see if you kind of just took the surface of a coral off the hard body that it constructs um, and instead draped it onto a sponge. Nice, cool. As uh, Scott France on land said, this is the land of overgrowth. <laughs> And it looks like in the background we have some uh, yellow corals. Uh, geez, maybe. No, they're not octocorals. I don't know. I'm not even going to take a guess. Um, I think those are zoanthids, right? Ooh. Uh, one of our ROV crew says that they are possibly zoanthids, and they said it with some confidence, possibly. so I'm going to agree with them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. Your, your guess is better than mine. <laughs> oh, and look at that. We have one of our uh, scientists on shore at DFO, Department of Fisheries and Oceanography at Canada, did confirm that those are zoanthid and enemies, not Carl. So give yourself a pat on the back uh, there, ROV crew. 
Right here. That was a good identification. Looks like it might be coming up to a little bit of a high spot here. Yeah. Plateau. Looks like that gets less steep. Yeah. Kind of flattens out a little bit. I'll come back to you, cool. Andy. Copy. Another interesting thing of note is all of the fan shaped animals you here, be, uh, both the corals and the sponges that, that Copy. are really seem to be oriented to present themselves with maximum surface area uh, to what I would assume perpendicular to the current direction in this area, which makes sense. That's an advantageous orientation to grow into. And yeah, wowzers, we're getting another really large wall just incredibly encrusted in the background right now coming into view. This is pretty magnificent. Just to reiterate, if uh, you're joining the dive recently, this is our dive number nine of Deep Connections. This is on Retriever Seamount. It's not the first time that we've dove on re Retriever Seamount so far. There have been a couple other ones. This depth range and this geographic location has been unexplored. And we were hoping it would be a similar kind of community to what was discovered before on Retriever Seamount. But um, this level of density and biodiversity is really stunning. For comparison, on Bear Seamount yesterday, we didn't see anywhere near either the density or the diversity that we're observing right now. Wow, lots more. So whole cliff is awesome. Saturated. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. awesome. <laughs> Close to tugging. Copy. I will not go any further from you. You probably haven't felt that swing yet, or you already did? It's I haven't really seen it move very much. I was going to say, it's probably just your bow. Uh, and we have our first uh, crab sighting of the dive so far. This but appears to be one of the. You want to snap in on Squat Lobster? Because you haven't seen a lot of these. Ah, I was looking at it backwards. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, so this is, does appear to be another squat lobster, a different color from the white ones that we've been seeing on this dive so far. Although I can see a white one's uh, claw, I think, in the background as well. And just that really uh, spiny carapace uh, is pretty distinctive. It appears to be reaching its claw out for something. I'm not sure what it's going for there. I don't know what they feed on or anything. Maybe this is what it's rummaging for right now. Yep, and I sit corrected. It is a lithodid, not a squat lobster. Very well. I thought it was a squat lobster too. All right, next video. Yep, oh, and I. Uh, uh, sit double, double corrected. Uh, it is definitely not a squat lobster. That's a king crab, uh, mm -hmm. apparently. Probably Neolithodes. Um, according to Bradley Sometimes Stevens, one of our uh, yeah. scientists on shore. Um, king crabs, those definitely uh, sound familiar. I believe those are pretty important commercial species. That definitely looked like a smaller version than the ones that you might be used to seeing in a hoity-toity buffets. Nice. So, co-pilot, uh, have you seen it move much yet? Well, we hauled in some in that time. Oh, okay. You know, which kind of pushes the cliff farther away. Yeah, and it looks like uh, coming gotcha. to view okay. is another one of these uh, the really movie? elaborate fans, uh, which are pink corals, despite the color not mm, being pink. You, coming up I on think there might be some of the 
seem in the, the background that actually are pink. The uh, last update was about 15 minutes late. So you still may have a few more minutes. Okay. So I was trying to watch to see if you were moving. Okay, video, come in. I'd like to get a close up of this. Kind of like the lighting. Well, when it when it gets to the 15 minute mark. Yeah, so this is you can see. Um, okay. okay. The light come strategy the of this particular Hold. type of coral, where it's got this really dense, uh, Maybe this interlocking time. array okay. of polyps that. Yeah, allow got, it to, to for water to pass through it freely, so, okay. but it acts like a fine mesh filter and removes anything from the water current that would uh, be delicious. And it looks like at the edge of here, if I'm not mistaken, that might be a really elongated body plan isopod that we've seen on other ones that kind of have themselves stretched out. They have specialized uh, claws at the end of their bodies for okay. holding fast in these currents, and they have the rest of their body extended outwards into the current to catch food. So it's a filter feeder or a passive feeder uh, taking advantage of another passive uh, feeder. Uh, copy. And that's pretty typical of these slow environments in the deep sea where one of these foundational species or as they were also called yesterday during our dive, engineer species provide that initial relief and elevation off the seafloor, and then a whole associated community of organisms yeah. take advantage of that elevation. Just doesn't end, huh? Did you copy that now? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, we'll let it go. Thanks. You ready for another time? You know, it was now? actually yeah. interesting looking yeah. at this yeah. hand yeah. through the, the coral. It didn't bearing? appear or like there were as many associates as we bit. usually see interspersed into the like branch. Right now, Conspicuously I'm absent, it, don't, it seems to be uh, more or less like a species or a okay. type specific thing. As we've seen in general, a lot less, not none, but a lot less brittle stars than okay. we saw on our we'll dive yesterday. You guys ready? Yeah. Bridge nav. Yeah, you ready for another move? That is a really okay. extravagant uh, distance. Ten meters, uh, deep one zero. sea sponge Bearing right there two, two, to three. the top left that At is just of zero forming what looks like an awning uh, over this entire area. You see them fanned out like that a lot, but you usually don't see them uh, connected that. Thank across. You. Can we get a zoom of like the base of that like tent like sponge? Yeah, it's like the garage sponge. Yeah. Carport sponge. Yeah. <laughs> okay, video, you can come in. Hold that for a second. Yeah, so it looks like it's not connected on our right to the ground. It's definitely connected at the center. And what I'm looking at is to the left to whether that's actually a hold fast connected to the ground. If it's not connected, it looks pretty close. And as you can see, kind of the shelter that it's forming, uh, there's a whole bunch of corals and maybe some anemones uh, underneath it. Yeah. Which maybe is really interesting. Later. I wouldn't Coming think that on. a sheltered location like that would be good for other filter feeders. You would think you would be in the shadow of something else that's competing for the same food but I guess the current is coming from the, uh, our relative direction enough at the time well. that they're not getting starved. I think it's okay. I'll try to hold that video. Uh, I like it there. But. All right. Yeah, I was going to hold it for like five more seconds and then I'll be done. Unless you wanted a closer look, watch the. Uh, no, that's okay. Yeah. I just wanted to overview. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Pilot's clear. And there's also, as you can probably see in the foreground, a number of uh, 
coral branches on the ground and a lot of the sponges that you've been seeing you've probably noticed are more the type of color of the ambient sediment instead of being those vibrant whites or yellows. So those are dead organisms, dead or dying organisms uh, that we can see a number of them. So it looks like in this area we're seeing just kind of a succession. Uh, some organisms don't end up uh, succeeding or grow to a certain amount of size and then die for whatever reason and they get uh, overgrown. Yeah, we can see another uh, red thing where if it's similar to the ones that we saw before would be a relatively small king crab. Yeah, and it looks like we're getting a couple more stalks of these bottle brush looking corals, which I believe our shore based scientist uh, Scott France identified as Chrysogorgia uh, coral. Come in. Go for uh, crab. Yeah, now I can see uh, at this angle, the orientation, it does look a little bit more like a uh, crab body plan that, that the kind of more extended yep. squat lobster. Yep. Um, but sometimes it can be pretty tough to tell. Um, sometimes the lobsters end up more uh, truncated and squished, and sometimes uh, crabs can be surprisingly elongated. It, it apparently gets pretty, pretty sim samey down Great here snap, sometimes. But yeah, this one, uh, spiny carapace, is uh, really distinctive, and it's got those, I believe, the maxillipeds around its mouth uh, moving. Okay, yeah. We were told by uh, yeah, definitely. Let us know. One of our uh, shore-based scientists at Texas we, we A&M the other day, when we were sample, having a nice uh, long look at another kind of crab, a red crab, hold those, that those so twitching um, yeah, give us as much little feathery as appendages that you see above okay, its mouth are its sense of smell, apparently. Um, which makes sense why it's probing with those. It's looking probably for chemical cues of good things to eat or maybe a mate or something similar. So the move's complete. Start feeling the swing here. What was that now? I said uh, move's complete. Copy. Okay, we're still pretty stretched out. You can come out video. Yeah, just going by the take off. Cirrus sonar, you're, you're starting to move in on it a little bit. It is slow. So you can come wide. Great. Oh, I see. Nice. You're still 25 meters. So. Next video. And the, the shift just stopped moving, correct? Correct, okay. yes. Yeah. So another five minutes or so. 10 minutes before I move? Yeah, I would, I would give it about 10, 12 minutes. And it looks like it's still, it got steep again, so. This is uh, really incredible. Uh, densely colonized wall on this eastern wall of Retriever Seamount that we're diving right now. And the different body plans that these sponges are t taking is just really interesting. There's a really elaborate, ornate, uh, horn-looking sponge uh, to the lower right that we saw as we were ascending up here. One of the other things uh, previous nav warned us of is if they do make heading moves, that they're definitely seeing a move um, that'll translate down. Oh. So we're going to have to watch that, especially if you're sampling. 
copy. So. Are they center of rotation A frame or midships? Yeah, it's still A frame, but oh. they still saw a, a, about a 15 meter move on their. This last is a good one. example of the lower right yeah. right now. Um, it was a sponge that one. has died. Yeah. You can tell that because it's Copy. the exact same color as the ambient so sediment around it. Doing a sample so these sponges we'll, that are alive we'll and have that ghostly white or blue-white color um, still have the ability to flush the sediments from inside its tissue, which the dead ones obviously do not have. I don't know exactly what the heading change was. How much it was a in this area in general, it looks like a relative uh, uh, relative slope change from the area above it. So you can see the sediment accumulation that is happening at the base of the slope. Or do you think that one has and again, a just a, uh, a bonanza of sponge. Minutes. Yeah, you're only, you're only five minutes into the oh, okay. stop, so kind of hoping you're starting to feel it. And, and it is showing up in the sonar in Cirrus. Uh, yeah, and an interesting comment made by uh, yeah. one of our shore based Some, scientists, Bradley Stevens, yeah. is that the depth range Maybe at which I, king crabs in the Western I Atlantic I live I is pretty much away. unknown. Yeah. And the reason for that is because it's not a commercial fishery. When you hear about out. king crabs or you're getting now king crab legs, they generally come from uh, places like so Alaska or near Scandinavia and Norway. Um, where when you have such a valuable fishery occurring there, you're going to get a lot of research on there so they can figure out uh, the maximum sustainable yield and uh, the areas that are most productive for fishing for them. Um, from this area, when we're seeing these observations of the juvenile crabs, it's almost, it seems, the same way as some of the other things in this okay, dive that we noted, where there's sure. so few okay. specimens of it that... Uh, so Every you, single uh, observation is just a down? new, Propeller? unique data point. Say again now? Are you going down or moving at all? I've been hauling in slightly. Okay. Well, even though you're hauling in, we're definitely coming in. If you look that at was nicely on. said, so, Jeff. Yep. So I think you're So the now. crab that you I'd were just looking at minutes. was one of those red, spiky, so well. long-legged king crabs. Yes, we... We speculated at first that it was a squat lobster. We were looking at it for a funny angle. Even if I wasn't looking at it from a funny angle, I probably would have thought it was a squat lobster. <laughs> <laughs> well, they are a little bit related, uh, seeing as the tail is tucked underneath the body in that way. And they're not uh, considered uh, true crabs, which is sort of mean, but... Uh, <laughs> They are considered king crabs, which is also sounding pretty awesome. I would rather Just be a king crab than a true uh, crab, but right now the I agree. bearing is about I don't know how much my opinion sure how is valued in arthropoda right circles. Now. I think once we get like up this ridge, we'll turn more to starboard. Is that yeah? You know what I mean? I mean, you're yeah. It looks still pretty, pretty steep. Yeah. So yeah, I think once we go up. Pilot, can we get a zoom on that little stick-looking uh, thing that doesn't have any sort of bushes or anything on it? Bear stick. Lower center? Yeah. I think it might be... Come in. Yeah, it's part of that one that does... Yeah, I think this is another one of those bottle brush style chrysogorgic corals, um, but the branches lower down have uh, fallen off. And we've seen that in other chrysogorgid corals. Uh, the chrysogorgid coral metallogorgia, which we saw on in yesterday's dive, uh, is known to lose its lower branches and then just have a poof of polyps right there at the top and an associated uh, snake star that lives on top. But this one I think might have just gotten damaged and is similar uh, to the one right behind it. What keeps getting me, though, is these coral skeletons that are covered in polyps and then with, like, sponges at the ends of the branches. Well, we saw the opposite uh, when you were no, having kind of floating, so. a live interaction a minute ago where we saw a really large <laughs> sponge that was mantled around the fringes with uh, corals. So I wasn't sure, but it looked like uh, to me that that might be one of those parasitic corals that you were talking about using yeah, a sponge as substrate shot, instead right. of another dead coral. 
We have seen uh, black corals that live on sponges before and mm -hmm. have collected uh, pieces of sponge with black coral living through it. So that would be a cool observation uh, if we're seeing that um, type of black coral growing on a sponge. Yeah, you'll have to uh, review the tape, which uh, anyone on shore watching this can do as well. Uh, yeah. Typically, maybe a month or so after the expedition, all of the footage from these dives will be publicly available to review. Uh, I believe chunked up into five-minute intervals uh, for just now, having huh? not truly yep. obnoxious file Great. sizes, um, as well as all the annotation done by our shore-based scientists uh, via sea tube. What I really want to know is what kind of coral or sponge okay. this skeleton is. Like, as I keep seeing the same sponge on the same type of branching pattern, dead skeleton. Yeah. Yeah, we're about 10 minutes past. And that it doesn't look like a corallium. So. And it, it doesn't look like a paragorgia. Maybe it's a type of branching oh, sponge. Okay. Good. I'm not ruling anything out with these sponges, uh, given what we've seen today. Okay, video. Frame it up. Come in. Oh, this is going to be a nice zoom. I love the zooms because they always help us answer some Kay. of these questions because I do know that some uh, demo sponges can you know, take some interesting forms and I'm not sure if this is a demo sponge or a glass sponge and if it's growing on an old coral skeleton or what, what's going on here but it's always the same type of sponge that we're seeing right on the edges of these coral fans and it definitely looks to me like this sponge came later, and this uh, skeleton is very, very old. It almost looks like a gold coral skeleton, yeah. but I don't... Gold coral is a Pacific species uh, endemic to uh, the Hawaiian Islands and North, North Pacific, so I would be surprised to see that here. It's just the color and the branching reminds me of it. How long ago was that move now now? And there it's goes another one of those uh, elongated oh, isopods that almost hang minutes. on uh, and pluck food so out of the currents. It was to the lower right, I think just we're at probably a, just out of screen now. Yeah. Oh yeah, we saw a whole family of Come those on a, on a sponge collected in the gully, right? Let's see what else we see on this colony here. Do a little scan. But there's lots of little bits of sponge pieces all along these branches. It's very curious. Sure, we can grab it. And then right there in the middle is uh, a cup coral. So that looks like a Desmophyllum cup coral. And all these like little trails of polyps, I believe, are stoloniferous octocorals. Uh, they don't actually create their own skeleton, but can overgrow uh, bare rock areas or bare skeletons or any can. hard substrate. Oh, yeah. You'll have to let me know when you see the video, but those look pretty similar to what we saw growing on the fringe of the sponge uh, before that I was telling you about. I will. Um, I'm definitely going to take a look at that later, and perhaps if we see another one, yeah, so we, we're, the way we see this branch sort of coming through the sponge, that that makes me think that it's just uh, a sponge that really likes growing on top of this coral. You can come in on it's that very, branch. Very crazy. Out of the sponge. I'm loving yeah. it. Sirius view is really neat right now as well, uh, looking at Deep Discover perched over this uh, really steep ledge. I'll bring you center. And Sirius is camera two, if you're following along at home. Perhaps this is the skeleton of one of those really big uh, corallium fans, those white ones, the one that's like just right behind it. it. Because it does look 
pretty robust. Maybe if we can see the end of this branch. Yeah, it does look like it broke off very cleanly. And so it might be very fragile, which would suggest that it's uh, part of that Corallian skeleton. And that's what we're seeing. It's just so encrusted <laughs> with uh, hydrozoans and other things that it has that brown look to it. But if it uh, was alive, it would right. look like the uh, fan right behind. Yeah, that's yeah, that's my theory. Yeah, and it even looks like the lower right head. corner of it is yeah, more of a, a pure white than the uh, too, general uh, brown and uh, a green coloration the of the rest of it. Another ten in. And very Scott France eight. does agree that it looks like a corallium, Tim. It's very overgrown, ten, kind of like the seven. one that we are seeing right now. And it makes sense to me that um, uh, these things are as fragile as you're saying that they would lose a lot of those secondary and tertiary branches pretty quickly okay. because they're just snapping off like twigs when only the Copy. more robust uh, okay. primary so, uh, tendrils Saint still like still, still right. live to tell the tale. You said you wanted Bad term to use for a dead organism. For? Yeah, <laughs> see, see where that puts the... But the size of some of these corallium fans is just impressive. Uh, and not just growing up into the water column, but also looking at the holdfast of that coral, uh, when most of them seem well, to be more uh, attached by a yeah, pretty small base. This one just looks like it's it's point, spreading it? outwards almost as extensively across the rock that it's attached to as into so the water column itself. Yeah, so way. given the size of you this coral and what I know about how quickly uh, these can, corals can grow in the yeah, Pacific, so. uh, I would yeah, guess that this coral right. is well over a hundred years old. Okay. So, so it's old and it's been here a while yeah, and yeah, the, the important thing back, if you're a really down. large yeah. fan in yeah. heavy current is to Probably have a very secure wave. base. Yeah. And so it definitely wave. has okay. secured its base onto Breaking this rock. Out. Yeah, I want to see about a move. I'm going to move eight meters. Yeah, and it's something we've touched two, upon two, three, uh, numerous times in this dive. Two knots. This dive and this expedition in general is just, we have a, a very firm qualitative that. knowledge that these communities right, are Andy, very slow you. growing and can get to, to be uh, very old. But we don't have so much of a sense of aging beyond that. Uh, I remember you were telling me that the there's not as robust a way to date or get chronology on these deep sea corals as there are on the uh, uh, shallow water ones. Um, you can get chronology on the deep sea corals. It's just really hard for the sponges because the, the sponges' uh, morphology can be pretty plastic and there isn't a good yeah, way a to good date to and yeah. find out which part of the sponge is youngest um, because they're made up of silica. Their their skeletons are glass, so dating that material is very difficult. And there has been a few studies that have started looking into dating sponges. And I actually found a a small article about some of those papers that Super I've saved because I want to go back and read them. So maybe in a couple of days I can tell you more about how they dated those sponges after I've read those papers. Uh, but first corals like this corallium coral, uh, you can actually take a section yeah, so a of bit, the base of that coral and it puts down rings and you can test different oh, areas within that uh, coral oh, base. It oh. acts sort of like the trunk of a tree uh, and you, call that you can then? use so carbon dating in order to figure out how old an individual might have been. But one of the main questions uh, that I tried to answer in some of my research is how long does it take for an entire community so to of, yeah. say, yeah. Corallium so to form? We might understand how yeah. old I, yeah, one gonna, individual might be, but me. one individual time, uh, and how long it lives is completely different time, uh, from the entire population. Yeah, and so if there were to be a disturbance event or a new uh, community to form, nice. It could take a lot longer than the lifespan of one organism for a, a community to, to come into being. So a community like this, to me, yeah.
tells me it's it's very very old. You're seeing very old uh, skeletons that are bare, uh, that have been overgrown by newcomers to the community, uh, really suggesting that you know this community has developed over many many years and has overgrown itself and gone through a number of shifts and changes in what it looked like. Coffee. Hi, video. Uh, can you confirm that we are still connected to the outside line? And my thought was that, you know, trying to figure out the ages of some of these sponges, I'm thinking some of those demo sponges might be uh, easier to date because they have skeletons that are made up of more than just glass. Um, they have other uh, parts of their skeleton uh, that could Not be more useful for yeah. our normal dating techniques. Uh, but since I don't know as much about demo sponges, it's hard for me to explain more. Uh, that's why you got to go forth and read papers and learn more because there's always something new and exciting that people are studying. And the way we share information is in science is by public, or, um, by publishing our findings and uh, letting other scientists know about what we're doing out here. Absolutely, Megan. That's uh, a big like part of the bread and butter of what we spend doing our time is uh, publishing our research in peer-reviewed journals because, as the saying goes, if you haven't published it, you haven't done it. Exactly. It's sort of like the, uh, the new saying is, if it wasn't on Facebook, there wasn't evidence, it didn't happen. So. You know, there's no reason to go out and do research and explore unexplored places and not share with the rest of the world. Uh, and that's what's so great about our program here on the Okeanos Explorer. Uh, this is America's ship for ocean exploration. We are not just exploring for ourselves as scientists, but we're exploring it's for you, the public, view. and all like of the scientists around the, the world who are interested in what we're doing. And we actually really do call like outs kind of to scientists areas. around the world to provide it's information uh, like about where we might want to explore yeah. and dive throughout our dive season. As you go up, it's bending, maybe? Yeah, it's a little hotter to starboard. Yeah, I could turn starboard, line up with it. Oh, no, it's fine. I'm just, uh, yeah. you know, trying to keep track of where I am. Oh, we've got Art over here. Hey. You see, D2 right now is facing about the right bearing for our target. Okay. And you're almost lined up on the wall. Up. What is the target? Is it just the top of the wall? Or yes. Is it? Okay. Bridge nav received. Thanks. Uh, pilot, I don't think we have a super specific target. I think we're really enjoying and getting a lot of out of what we're seeing right now. So it's just fine to stay the course right now and make your general way towards that waypoint. Okay. Copy that, watch Lee. Okay, perfect. Not a hard target. Yeah, the the waypoint's at the top. So yeah, they like, they're right I was going to ask the same question, the so <laughs> you answered it. Thanks. Ridges are the good stuff. Roger that. Thanks. I was about to ask the same question you were. So, but yeah, we're yeah, heading for that. I high apologize point. if there even, was even a lapse in the audio. If you were, were still watching along, we had a uh, live interaction area, a little so. bit ago, so there were some multiple audio changes. But we are continuing our dive on Retriever Seamount right now. We're at approximately 
2,530 so meters. Uh, Water depth. Continue our ascent up this ridge arm. And uh, it's been uh, pretty invariant in terms of geology and biology as we're climbing, but I don't think either of us are particularly complaining about this because it's been really cool. Huh? Yeah, this is what I would call a uh, dense deep sea coral and sponge community, and it's also extremely diverse. The, uh, can you guide me a little bit? Uh, top left. Top left. Okay, with the little spots on it. Yeah, pilot, we're interested in those spots. Copy. No, I have a feeling that those little spots are an associate. Um, it could be what you were seeing earlier, maybe an associated uh, coral or hydroid, okay, or um, even there's some snails or other type of mollusk that lives on a sponge. Video, do you copy? Video, do you, uh, could you go impartial? Yeah, it really feels like the real estate here is, is, uh, at a, pre a premium. Everybody, all these animals are living on top of each other here. We, we have associations galore. Uh, Video, sponges pilot. on sponges, corals on sponges, sponges on corals, Copy. other that. animals on other animals. This is a really, really cool dive. Just stand by one moment on that zoom, uh, watch Lee. We'll get a little bit closer in the meantime. And it's really important to catalog these associations between other yeah, animals. And we've actually seen a number Before of unexpected yeah, associations that we've never seen bit. before. Uh, like yesterday's Trump dive yeah, at Bear Seamount, we were just discussing how we never see brittle stars on black corals and then there was a brittle star on a black coral. So now we can't say that. We say that sometimes we see that association and it's really good to know uh, sure, uh, still can. The, how can frequent these up, associations uh, are. There's so many things that Hollywood. we don't know about our deep sea and there's so much left to be learned about these communities. Kay. We are just exploring this community for the very first time here on Retriever Seamount and this is the first time anyone has ever seen this community. And what we do know and what I what I keep talking about is all stuff that, you know, I've seen in the past at, and watched in other videos from other sea mounts. And it's through these types of explorations where we can learn more and try to figure out different questions to ask. So I'm hoping that in the future, after seeing these dives, other scientists will start to form hypotheses and, you know, be able to get grants in order to come back here and study more about the communities that we've explored. Watch leads. We're just going to hold here until we can uh, resolve the video issue. I think I should try and do a tow, co-pilot. Port tow. Uh, your float there, or yeah, go. I'll go wait. The port tow actually. Go ahead. Yep. Specifically, the spots on the sponge. Copy. Copy. Oh, that's really cool. It is. It is a coral. Um, but it's not 
a black coral, which is what I have seen growing out of sponge like this. I think it's a type of soft coral, uh, especially seeing how this particular individual has sort of crunched in on itself. So that's what they do if they feel uh, threatened. Uh, they can retract uh, their bodies down to a small little bit. And you can see how the polyps have pulled in their tentacles. Yes, yeah, sorry. Nice that is really interesting. I've never seen soft coral <laughs> on a sponge before. Yeah. Black coral, yes. The clatterizids, those uh, carnivorous sponges that we saw yesterday. I was like, okay. Yeah, that seems like something that would happen. This is interesting. This is definitely a new one for my book. Do you want to inspect this, uh, this sponge any further, watch? Uh, yes, let's get a good okay. look at one of the open colonies that has its uh, tentacles out. That'll help for identification. Copy. Yeah, are you full wide? Okay. So we're going to yeah, take gonna a longer look at this because this is really cool. <laughs> Would you bring the port swing arm in? Yeah. Absolutely. Only a slight bit excited. I would uh, definitely go with very excited. So excited. Okay. Thank you. Port lower is stowed. Maybe not the most excited because then I might be bouncing off the walls. But if that's going to happen, this is the dive that it's going to happen on. It's a shame we're not diving on a day that begins with an S because it seems like it should be a sponge Saturday or a sponge Sunday. Well, it's just sponge Tuesday. That can be a thing. It certainly is a thing today. Okay, you can go in video. So I've been looking through the guide, the animal yeah. guide, and trying to figure out what kind of sponge this is. And I think it might be a type of conolasma. And then these are, Oops, you know, now that I'm getting a better look at these associated corals, uh, they're definitely yep. soft okay. corals in the family Nidality. Uh, but I can't go any further with an identification other than that. And we've seen something similar growing on rocks, but... I don't think we've any, have seen any of these on hard substrate, like on the rocks today, but there's a number of them growing on this sponge, which is uh, quite a treat, you know, a very unusual observation. It looks like there's also a, a little, yeah. very faint crinoid uh, as well, uh, unless I'm mistaken, some sort of tube thing with uh, uh, a yeah, sea lily looking. Yeah, so that tube uh, thing that yeah. you're seeing, Jeff, like is a type of hydrozoan sure. uh, in the family uh, tubularity. Which one you we have with? seen those on one? sponges before. Yeah, that one. Oh, that's cool. Little. That is very, very cool. And... Look at down at the base of these corals. It's got sort of an encrustation where it's growing. I'm not sure if that's created by the coral itself or perhaps it's, um, you know, gathered sediment in order to keep itself Look attached to this sponge. I like that little guy. Very, very cool. So you're slipping down. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. You want your rotator back? Sure. Thanks. Back to you. Copy. Is that a... Uh, do you want me to try and maintain this zoom longer? Watch lead or... Uh, I think we're good. Okay. We're going to keep moving on looking for some cool stuff. Copy. Thank you for the zoom. You're welcome. Yeah. I'm getting pretty close here. Copy. So maybe we should come up a little bit. 
So I'm thinking that the next time we see one of those old Corallium skeletons that has a bunch of that sponge growing over it, we might want to take a collection of that. Uh, it keeps striking me as a really interesting thing that um, we don't know what it is, and then the collection of the Corallium part of the skeleton can be relatively informative to people who are studying the age and growth of those corals. But maybe we, we want to collect some of this because it's hard to collect the soft corals. Um, Pilot, yes, when we were Roger. looking at that sponge with all those soft corals on it, do you think you can get a piece of that sponge with the soft coral? Uh, stand by, watch lead. Oh, uh, the one you were just looking at? Yeah. What do you think, of Pilot? Yeah. yeah, like so. That's how brittle it is, but. Do you want to, um, so how do we set up? What if you put um, both toes and have it kind of like pretty close to your face? Okay. Know, try that, like saddle it maybe? Yeah, keep an eye on my sonar. Yeah. Let me know if I get closer. Um, yeah, try that. Try putting two toes on the ground and s like straddle it and then see how close it is to your face. Okay. If it's far enough away, maybe you can. Or just go like turn to starboard. I'll stow the starboard stuff, and you put your port side or the port stuff. You put your port so side. Yeah, Scott Franz in the chat was just saying that in. collecting like, soft like corals like this can be very difficult because they the rock, retract against the rock the way we saw that it. first yeah. colony retracted against the sponge. The upper end. But getting a piece of the sponge, which was also on okay. my radar as potential collectible, um, with this association, could be a really good. Um, piece of science, yeah. especially so people studying the associations so more, between um, corals and sponges and associated organisms with sponges. Rock, okay. Rather than having your face in it. So yeah, hi, Megan. Uh, uh, Scott here. So I agree. Uh, I was so surprised when I saw this. I don't yeah, recall ever down, seeing a soft up. coral growing on a sponge. Yeah. Um, it's you know, it seems like a pretty nice it's little habitat the there raised off of okay. the rock. Um, oh, so then perhaps so the protected from grazing or urchins or other things that are you, moving nice by, so maybe this is a good place to be. And to then to the other point that, that these soft corals are really difficult to collect in there. Um, if they're just growing on a substrate care, unless you can get the substrate themselves because the in this case work. they're very small but they also squish down as you saw that first one that we looked at. So being able to take a piece of the sponge that included some of the um, soft corals would be a real bonus in allowing us to um, identify two elements of the diversity and then the association. Are we full wide on that camera? Thanks for that, Scott. Um, do you know the best way to relax uh, soft corals in order to be able to see their polyps? Yeah, play music. Down a little Pull out a little, or pull away from the... Work that left toe a little closer to the, to the prize. Copy. And then road. Once you get that, yeah. Okay. And then maybe heading a little to port. Okay. And then really. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then. What's nice about having one toe in, if you change heading, that will get the arm closer and further away. So, so that'll okay. be like you can adjust the base of the manipulator distance. Okay, so now you can get joy lock in. Now change that heading and see how it reacts. You bring the heading to port a little bit. Okay, that's what I'm doing now. Okay, yeah, and we'll see how it reacts here. It's probably good. Hold that. Leave your set point there. See if it's nice and steady. You push them down, 34. Okay. Um, so I think the port, we will have to like grab some of it and then. So we're getting into okay, position right now and bit, yeah. our ROV crew is discussing the optimal method for sampling this to try to get piece of the sponge as yeah, well as one of those uh, soft yeah. corals. Yeah. Let's see what that does. Let it settle out. Um, 
I would suggest, it depends if it's brittle or not, we could grab and then suck it up with the suction sampler. Okay. Because uh, the alternative is to take off, then open the drawer, and I'm concerned if it's brittle, it'll fall out of the jaws. But yeah, I think I think the suction's a good idea. Okay. So should we go for that bottom lip? Yep. Exactly. It's kind of... Yeah. So, Pilot, just to let you know, this sponge is going to be very fragile and break apart, sort of like a, a chip. Okay. Okay, so brittle. Yeah, so I'm thinking lower, come in from below, grab, hopefully some stays in the jaw, and then we'll just uh, carefully bring it to the, uh, hopefully I'll partially extend the drawer, and then all you got to do is bring it to the suction sampler. We'll get it in drawer three, I think was ready. That's what I yes. would do. Okay. Um, yeah, so it should be spread off. I think that'd be why. All right, when you're ready, would you uh, bring up the mini Zeus? On the Absolutely. You going to keep an eye on my sonar? Yes, yes. I am. Yep. Okay. You've creeped in a little bit, but you're still 12 and a half. Delta's 20, so it's about, okay. Yeah. And we're not moving anymore, so and it's been a while, so you should be pretty stable. Okay. Okay, so I think it's just super. I'll keep an eye on it. Then. Okay. Thanks, Nav. Okay. Yep. Okay. Okay. So, index hydraulics off. We spun up. We spun us up already. Yes, that's correct. Okay, would you bring the mini on the arm? Yes. Come to start with. Okay, there you go. Okay, our drugs coming on. Yeah, I like doing this setup because the moving the base of the arm. Uh -huh. relative to the ground uh, can help with your joints sometimes and all it is is a heading change and it moves quite a bit so I see two options either wrist all the way up and Kay. then go in or wrist all the way left as you Okay, so wrist all the way up would be coming in and mostly working the elbow? Yeah, so yeah, so wrist, yeah, yep, that's one option. We could also like come down on the upper ledge too, that's another option, because I'm concerned we won't be able to come up that much, so uh -huh. maybe, maybe try the upper one and come straight down. Okay, Upper so left side of it. So or come in like that. Yeah, like straight down on it. That would be. All right, and then so I would try and get the jaws underneath it. Yeah, like so. One set of jaws in the center, and one set of jaws on the outside, upper left. And then if you can't reach it, you will, we can just change your heading set point to the left a little bit, and that'll get your arm closer. Yeah. Although you do have quite a bit of reach. I'm going to rotate your D2 Zeus up a little bit here. Thank you. Let's see what's going on. Okay. Yeah. And then I also like to, when I get close to the edge, uh -huh. I like to nudge it. And then I can see the reaction of this subject. And you, that gives you an idea of how it's going to react once you grab it. So, you know, she said it's going to be like a potato chip. Oh, so you're getting, I would, ro I would shoulder right. Okay. Shoulder away from the camera. Shoulder away. Yeah, there you go. Okay. And then elbow down so you can get into the field of view. Yeah. Shoulder, yeah, elbow down. Yeah. Get into the camera view here. Nice. There we go. Okay. And then maybe change that. Your, uh heading to the port a little bit might get the arm a little closer okay I'll watch your toes 
Yeah, if I might have you move me back, Sirius, back a little bit. Yeah, you're at uh, a little, little less than 12 and a half. Now. Yeah. Do you want to back up? Like uh, five meters or something? Five meters? Yeah. Or 10. Okay. Um, so we were at roughly 223. Do you want me to just take 220? Um, 45. So 45 would be okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll get that in. Uh, you want to do it slow or? 0.2 is fine. Just do it 2.2. Yeah. Okay. And then grip force. Bridge nav. Maybe like. Yeah, we want to make a little move. Five meters at a bearing of four five at a speed of zero decimal two knots. Grip force is three. That's good. Yes, sir. Thank you. I am going to see if how the. I'm going to drop just a little bit just to see the suction nozzle. Okay. D2 rotator up if you want to see what's going on. Yeah, I don't think, I'm not sure I quite have the reach to get around the top of it. Force feedback enabled? I think you might have to turn uh, hydraulics off. So you can index out, turn hydraulics off, and then that menu should. Hydraulics are off? Oh, yeah, c press the blue button there. It, it, the light's on, though. Oh, okay. Uh, what's the ratio at? Three. Okay. I think um, in order to turn it on or off, we would have to st like stow the arm and then turn it on or off. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? No, I, I just was wondering, I was feeling some resistance. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's, so you think you're at the limit on that joint, and you're close to the limit on that joint. Yeah, so... try and nudge it a little bit away. Okay. Okay, so just kind of go down and grab a hunk and yeah. then bring it back to the suction sample. And I'll follow you with Mini Zeus. All right, it's not going to cut it, so I'm just going to I'm going to be tearing yeah, it. Yeah, so I think come in and we'll see how it reacts if it shatters. If it doesn't, the twist really will rip it. Okay. And then a lot of it should stay in the cut in the tie gun or in the draws. Okay. And I try to grab some of those associates. That's what they really want. It's those little corals on there, so those little dots. Try to get a bunch of those in the center. Might crush them a little bit. Let's just sit you there. Okay. And then once you close the jaws, if you close them all the way, the left button will keep them closed. Okay. The, the jaw index, the jaw lock. Okay. Okay, so that was the long press, so it went into one-to-one -one mode. So now, um, once you index in, it might jerk a little bit. So maybe the first thing I would do is press index and come up, and that way it'll come up away from the... Okay. So don't fight the motors, but yeah. So just press index, then come up. Come up, yeah, okay. Okay, so you have quite a few chunks in there, so let's get that close to the 
Okay. Uh, I'll draw out the mini Zeus down so you can. Okay. Okay. That's about as far out as I can get you. So if okay. you can get it close to the end of that nozzle. All right. Could I see the? Could you? Uh, yeah. Bring the mini back so I can see. Thanks. Yeah. I'll follow you down. And then Nab, can you watch our jar? Let's see what comes in. Yep. Okay, there you go. I got you in this camera too. Okay. Right. Okay. That looks like I'm pretty close. Not sure if I'm uh, standing by one on this section. So. Yeah. Okay. Can set, you see air flow or uh, water flow? I'm seeing a little bit of movement, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. There you go. All right. I think I'm sucky. We got 1,800 RPM. It's pretty, pretty good amount of suction. Okay. So maybe get just a little closer, release. Okay, here we go. Uh, See two chunks. Got a couple little pieces. There's, there's a piece. Yeah, I do know that. Oh, there you go. Uh, looks like mostly sponge. I didn't see any of the associates on that. Try and scrape it off. You can try to. There you go. Nice. There's a lot of. There pieces. we go. There's some pieces. Uh, it's hard to hard see. Hard to see. Maybe after you stop, it'll drop a little bit. It might be worth asking them if you can. Uh, another option is grab the suction sampler nozzle uh -huh. and go out there and scrape one of those things off of there. What okay. I was, you know I was what wondering, mean? you had a couple pieces break off too that looked like they had uh, right there in the middle. They have uh, some associates, maybe. Um, it's hard to see. Yeah, I would ask, ask the watch if they want us to try to vacuum some off. Watch uh, this, pilot. You did get an associate. Hey there, pilot. I, I'm not sure if we got any of the corals. Um, do you mind trying to break off just yeah. another small piece? I Actually, if you look at jar three right now. Yeah, maybe we can put at it the up bottom. on one of the monitors. It looks like there is an associate on that piece that's laying at the bottom. But it, if you want to go for the other one. I don't have a jar. Okay. So yeah, I would Video do. pilot. Can you route what's on uh, that monitor up to the jar can? Maybe. I'm not sure which one that uh, is. Mark should have it. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's a uh, okay. ROV jar. I can. Uh, yeah, you want put it, it up on, on the, the right? big right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you have to stay on that row. Yeah. You can. yeah okay, and we're just trying to check, is, make sure we we got some of those corals. Um, I don't know. Uh, actually, we don't. Because that's going to be here. our main specimen for this collection. Um, I can put it up on eight, which would be... Not that the sponge isn't really cool, believe, right and having there. a specimen of that isn't important. It's just this association so between these corals and the sponge is no, what makes this collection work. such an interesting yeah, and uh, special one. collection. Uh, watch lead. We're, we're trying to get it up on one of the bigger monitors that you're able to see, but in the But meantime, you do see one in there, at yeah, least? Yeah, it, so. Okay, we have it back here. There is one. It would be best if we had two. Okay. Just so we can have one for genetics and one for mor morphology. Okay, so are, do you want just the associate? I could try and use the suction to kind of scrape one off, or I could go and just kind of grab um, another piece just of the Just the portal, associate, the if you think that would be easier. Okay, what do you think, co pilot? Yeah. Oh, uh, that's Depends a string. On, how on there, but mm -hmm. I think it'd be kind of go up and then kind yeah, of just Yeah, I don't want to be greedy, yeah. but yeah. it's also, uh, that's a very small organism, and so we want to make sure we have enough All tissue right, so for the genetics and you, for looking at it morphologically. Yes. Okay. I would like to draw out 
I'm gonna try to turn it up just a little more. That's gonna push us off a little bit. Um, I'll try something. Video, would it be possible to increase the gain a little bit? Thank you, video. I'm drawing out. Oh, good idea. Minus some space here. D2 rotator up. Kay. Okay. So just be very careful because that's awful close to the camera. But yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Gr I group force at like five on the uh, on okay. that end effector and try to grab the. Is it this a touch screen? Yeah. Grip force five. Yeah. Grip force five. Right. Oh, that was feedback. Yeah, so when we get this in the lab, we'll Video, look at turn the uh, light both specimens so and right put the one here. that is uh, the go. least amount right. damaged from collection in ethanol for preservation. That and then you. the yeah. other one will go into one of our genetic sample tube, which is also uh, we'll grab it, pull in it out ethanol, a little bit, and then I'll uh, but that'll more. be sampled okay. for genetics. Your, uh, so they'll be in two different archives within the Smithsonian. But with so many people looking into the genetics of these animals and comparing um, yeah, try to grab it. animals yeah, across sure. seamounts, yeah. I think it's really important to be able to get enough of a sample that we can put uh, some tissue aside for That's DNA. Good. You can come up a little bit. Yeah. That's good. Okay, grip lock it. And then pull out a little bit, and then I'll retract the drawer. Okay, grip lock. Oh. Okay, grip lock is the right button. Now I can index out. Uh, yeah, so the sampling strategy was to uh, tear off a piece okay. of this really fragile sponge okay. and then move the piece that was still on the manipulator so arm the, uh, to the yeah. suction sampler. And now okay. we are going to grab the suction sampler move it out and to the sponge to try to vacuum out I, what I do another is I uh, one or two of those right. polyps. Keep everything else the same, just shoulder right. Okay. Okay. All right, hold that and I'll draw in. Okay. And I'll bring that wing back up right out of your way. Okay, all right. All right, okay. let's do this. Bring the mini zoos up for you. Thanks, Art. Okay. See, so yeah, I would start with the bottom one, maybe. And just start suction on a thousand. Okay. Make the end effector set up perfectly for this. And maybe, like, wrist turn it left so that way you can still see it from Zeus. Yeah, that's you know right. What I mean? Yep. Yeah. The hose looks good. I got a thousand. I can increase the suction once we get closer. Okay, I'm still pretty far away. Not passing the orange line, am I? No, not even close. I, we got a lot of hose left. I would uh, maybe, yeah, wrist left, shoulder right. Yeah, there you go. Okay, great. Okay, increasing. 1,800. Can you keep an eye for me, Mark? Yep, watch it. I got eyes on drawer. Nice. Wow, look at <laughs> There you go. That was it's awesome. In there. <laughs> I did not expect that uh that sampling strategy. Uh, <laughs> that great amazing. job, pilot and team. <laughs> yeah. 
Nice. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, section's off. Perfect. In there, now right? we officially Mark have two now. of yes. those yes. soft it corals. In. It looks like and you got at least two. That there. worked so. way better than what I had thought. That was just amazing. Ab absolutely. <laughs> Scott, Scott, yeah. Scott France on land was just discussing yeah. numerous methods, but apparently discounted the now tried and All true right. just <laughs> suction a hole in this punch and grab the polyp that way. You know, yeah, now you that I've seen that work, I think that there, this might be our new sampling method for these crunchy sponges, because okay. trying to grab them with Hold the it. manipulator, it just, they just yeah, fall yeah. into... Like Mixed tiny in. little chips, yeah. like Lego. you Lego there. have like little your snap. big crane yeah. ha hand, like going into you the bag of chips and you just like crush them. Nice, uh, yeah, now that we know awesome. we can use the suction sampler the suction as a sampler, that, that was perfect. combination cookie cutter slash vacuum cleaner. Uh, mm -hmm. Who wants anything else? Uh, and these suction samplers are available for fifty nine ninety nine with a few monthly payments. <laughs> A few I monthly payments of fifty nine ninety nine. Yep, no, just kidding. Back is on set up. I think. I mean, we... you could just pay yeah, fifty nine okay, ninety nine for your, uh, your Dyson vacuum yeah, like said, and I'm, modify I'm it for deep sea work. It looked like you got a, I guess a that would probably work just as well. No oh, modifications yeah, necessary. Okay, too, so. Well, maybe okay. just the point yeah. where uh, right, right, gonna, the electrical uh, components the being off. in water. But you know, if you're an engineer, not a problem, right? Nice. Okay. That was awesome. Awesome. I love the instant replay too. That was that definitely takes the cake for most creative sampling effort okay. that worked better than planned. Yeah, right oh, there. absolutely. Look how perfect that is. Yeah. See, there's one there, and then if you spin it, spin it. I know, just a and the sponge. More, bring it around. I'm. There's. I think there's. Fairly certain that this sponge will okay. easily close yeah. this hole after we've so. left so if we came back years from now to look at this sponge that hole will have closed okay, up and yeah, grown anyway. over because okay. sponges like this uh, have a pretty plastic right. morphology and, uh, and again we have uh, in the a tissue in this area three, just like you know if you've got a cut or a scrape will start out. to close up that so. hole and mend it so you know we haven't permanently damaged this sponge it will repair itself okay and now we have a new uh, standard operating procedure uh, for this for this type of sponge. It seems. So we're gonna kind of regroup on nice which way we're headed. That was very cool. Yeah, nice job. Everything about this dive is very cool. I feel like I keep saying that over and over blow again. Your upper. Okay with it. Copy. Yeah. Oh wow. Oh wow. Deployed. And then we have another huge corallium coral fan, and looks like there's a small little crab at the base of this coral. Is that the same uh, king crab that you saw earlier? Yeah, it looks like the same type. Uh, a little, the yeah, looks like color, I can't tell whether it's part. probably just that we don't have uh, lights focused yeah. on it, that it looks a little paler than the other Ship ones. So I know so the, the Neolithodes well, tend to be a very Should deep red color, off? and then this one to I me did, looks did, like yeah. it could be a Paralomus. Yep. Uh, they tend to be a lighter pink com color, uh, but this is a very far view, so I'm just using my my knowledge of seeing things from far away and matching them with what I've seen before. There are a lot of different possibilities and the zooms with our camera are so important for us to be able to get really good IDs and we can see so many details that would be hard to see otherwise which is very amazing in my book. And I think this crab that we're sending on now is that one that you saw before with really long legs, a deeper red color. Yeah, it looks like a really good climber making its way up this vertical wall. Or not. <laughs> uh, I jinxed it. Sorry, crab. <laughs> <laughs> Upside is... You don't fall quite as fast when you're underwater. No, I think this might not be uh, his first round up the uh, vertical cliff wall, if I'm guessing.
go in, Art. Looks There's like one. it's missing a claw as well. It is. That's got to make climbing a little more difficult. It might. Just going to look at see what we got here for a second. It's using one of those many sponges as a uh, foothold. Does that move 10 meters we did earlier? I think it just needs to get one no, of its out claws five. in that crevice. Glad we did. But that does yeah. look like a difficult it climb. Just a little bit of a buffer there. Yeah. Looks like this thing goes straight up for a little bit, huh? Uh, yeah. Uh, you go ahead, yeah. Co-pilot, what is that behind on this? Uh, it's a right, little bit. Is it? Yeah. Okay. That's what I was yeah, there's nothing there. <laughs> Thank you. It's kind of like, okay. I'm going to yeah. try and... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> There's something that's well, bigger than P2. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> what's up sneaking up behind the surface with it? <laughs> I figured it was reflection. Yeah. So, okay. So this crab will eventually regrow uh, its claws and legs if it loses them. And all these king crabs that we've been seeing so far today um, as Bradley Stevens on land says, they're all juveniles. Um, as you can imagine, if this was a fishery, there wouldn't be much uh, meat to get out of those legs. Quite skinny. I think it would also be hard to trap these animals, seeing as they live on such steep and rugged terrain. Uh, it just wouldn't be a good place to fish for them. Yeah, and just uh, fishing in general is off the board here as Retriever Seamount, where we are right now, is within the Northeast Canyons and Seamounts Marine National Monument, which is protected under the Antiquities Act of 1906. And this is the Seamounts unit of the Northeast Canyons and Seamounts Marine National Monument that we're in right now. The other unit of it is the Submarine Canyons where we dove the last dive before we went into port at Newport um, to get away from Hurricane Dorian. So habitat assessment, diversity assessment, biomass assessment, they're all pretty critical activities in these areas which are relatively protected from human predation and therefore should hopefully be a decent environmental baseline to compare areas that are being actively fished. And there are four seamounts within the seamounts unit of the uh, Northeast Canyons and Seamounts Marine National Monument, and those seamounts are Bear, Visalia, Retriever, and Mytilus seamounts. So four seamounts and one uh, Marine National Monument, and all these seamounts are likely to host these really fantastic deep sea coral Watch and sponge yeah, communities yeah, yeah, on okay. their steep slopes and Thank flanks. Yeah. So we have done explorations on, I believe, three of the four, um, not just still. the Okinos Explorer, still. but other uh, scientists as well. And this is our it's second okay dive within the Seamounts unit. Uh, the first dive being at Bear Seamount yesterday, and today we're at Retriever Seamount. And these seamounts were actually created by a mantle plume or hot spot in the mantle. Uh, and as the plates move over that uh, mantle hot spot, they create these island chains or seamount chains. And over the approximately 30 or 40 million years that the mantle plume was active, they have varying levels of intensity, so it kind of ignites and reignites. And uh, look at this weirdo sponge. Let's talk about this big weird sponge. Yeah, I'm wondering if now that we've collected that specimen of the soft coral, if what we're seeing here on this really crazy yellow sponge is a bunch of soft corals. And what's really getting me about this sponge is that most of it is yellow, and then there's a part that's white. So maybe it's two different sponges or I'm not sure what's going on here 
it looks a lot like um, that sponge that we just collected from, but the yellow part looks different, different to me. So maybe it got encrusted with another type of sponge. And then the soft corals are also growing on this sponge. Yeah, it's a color contrast similar to the uh, what I've been calling the volleyball or the sponge cake upper. sponges that we were yeah, seeing earlier with that contrast between the bright white and then that, uh, that yellow with the additional plot twist of having uh, soft coral looking things on its surface too. Yeah, I'd really like to see that boundary between the white and the yellow, if possible, pilot. Copy that, watch lead. We were just pulling in our port swing arm so we could kind of get a better angle for you. I'm going to go back in now. So my current theory is that this was a glass sponge, just you. like the yeah, one that we go. were sampling, but it's been overgrown by an encrusting yellow demo sponge. That's my current theory of, of what happened here on this sponge. And it looks as well a area of the glass sponge the is that video. sediment color that indicates that it's uh, unhealthy, I believe, right? Yeah, there's that dark brown uh, section, and that would be a dead portion of the sponge. It definitely looks like it's been overgrown with another sponge. So perhaps this uh, the sponge was starting to die, and the stem sponge started colonizing it. And as the live tissue uh, recedes, the demo sponge, that yellow sponge, takes over. That is really neat. It is. It's a sponge paint job. It kind of looks like uh, modern art to me. I could see it as an installation. I turned your uh, still cam up. Copy. So we can grab one. And I'm trying to also take, I'm seeing all of these small um, soft corals that are just right. all of the rocks. And I was saying before when we made that collection that we hadn't been seeing soft corals all over the rocks. And then here they are on every single rock we're looking at. And they're also on this uh, sponge uh, yeah, that we're I taking a look at. Soft corals everywhere. So this is a pretty uh, abundant species in this area. So it was... It makes a very good uh, collection, and it would have been extremely difficult to collect them from the rocks. So I'm really glad we got both a piece of this well. type of sponge sure. and some of those soft corals. So, Megan, I had to step out. I'm curious what you're thinking about this yellow and white sponge here. Is this yellow overgrowing the white, or is this all the same sponge? Well, originally I thought the yellow was overgrowing the white, and now that we're looking at it closely, it looks it doesn't look like a demo sponge overgrowing the white. It, I have no idea what's going on. I had this great story, but I don't know. What made you change your mind, Megan? Well, we can actually see the skeletal structure of the sponge. Um, that yellow part looks exactly like the white part um, structurally. Video? No, but the no, color no, is just options. different. Yeah. You're doing a great job floating, though. Thanks. We're all ears for theories, Scott. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's, I mean, it's fascinating. Um, you know, when I first saw this, I was standing by the screen, but um, I was away, so I couldn't hear what you were saying. And I was thinking, well, we've seen lots of white sponges, I think, like this. Uh, the, sort of that big ear sponge. And uh, now this one seems to have this yellow overgrowth, but I agree, close up, it sure looks like it's just the outer layer of this one sponge has a yellow color, which suggests that the cells there are undergoing some different chemistry. Yeah, and we have seen, you know, sponges with this yellow color, so that's not unusual. Sure. It's just this particular one, we've only ever seen it in white. Yep, exactly, yeah. So it's not the color that's unusual, it's this combination of colors that throwing us. 
Yeah, I've never seen like a half white, half yellow sponge before. Starboard light. Uh, other than the the sponge cake ones that we were we were seeing before, which might have been two different species. Uh, yeah, it's just uh, very confusing. Yeah. Yeah, but the sponge cake sponge is a demo sponge, and we've seen demo sponges with different texture along the outer cortex of the sponge. Uh, but this is a glass sponge, and so it doesn't do the same things. And the fact that only this small area on the lip of the sponge is actually white, like we've seen with all the other ones we've seen during the dive, yet the rest of this is yellow, is just odd. Uh, I'm not sure how... Such a perfect line there also. Look on the lip, you know? It's like a perfectly straight line. Exactly. It's like, it, that, at like one side said, it decided... This, this, to me, I'm moving back to, it's an overgrowth. That, that lip uh, video. Maybe I it's such a thin that overgrowth that, that we're seeing the, the corner, structure yeah. of the sponge beneath it. Hmm. That is a mystery. Well, that'll be one for the sponge books. Are there any other views I just asked like my student who walked in, and she right away said that's two sponges. <laughs> okay, you Problem solved. Back out. Two <laughs> okay, sponges, two sponges. Uh, yeah, apparently. So that goes about an hour yeah. Two sponges in one vase <laughs> with a whole bunch of corals. Yeah. And Scott, did you check out the density of anything. these soft corals all over this rock? Maybe we'll, once we back away, I'll stow the upper and then... Okay. They'll all be stowed, and we can go gotcha. for it. I think that'll be better for this. Watch lead nav. Go ahead, nav. Yeah, I just want to give you a heads up. About an hour of bottom time left, so just an update. Yeah, you could go Copy that, nav. Okay. Are there any other views of this sponge that you'd like, Watch lead? I'm happy with our sponge views. Uh, uh, let's keep moving on. Copy. Thanks. I'm excited to hear from uh, our colleagues, Ellen Kensington and Lindsay Beasley at the DFO, who have so much uh, sponge domain knowledge, and I'm sure they'll have uh, opinions on it as well when they see the footage. And it's also r really cool to me to looking at these uh, corallium corals and the wideness of their base. Oh, and there's another sponge with like yellow piece and the rest of it's white. Huh. Yeah, it looks like the one to the left as well is multicolored as well, but that uh, looks like another one of those uh, chunky sponges instead of the uh, frilly glass sponges. At least it looks. I'm not sure the dimensionality of it. You know it would be interesting, Jeff? Counting how many times we said the word sponge today. When you stepped away, I, I definitely said that this is going to be by far the most times I'm ever going to say sponge in my life in a short amount of time. All right. So we have a world of sponges to explore and so many corals. I feel like the further we've gone up along this seamount ridge today, the denser uh, the community got. And you were saying at the beginning of the dive, Jeff, that you know it was sparser than some of the dives that we had seen in some of the canyons that we were exploring during this expedition. But I think right now we have quite a good amount of surface cover here with all of these soft corals. Enough to rival uh, those canyon dives. For sure, yeah. And uh, it obviously starts to make the amateur ecologist in me wonder what controls that distribution, whether it's preferential currents or 
just the depth range, something to do with the oxygen or salinity of Go this ahead, particular watch, area. Yeah, we can uh, take a look at that. So, you're, uh, so one of the coral skeletons that I'm just about to center up on and put the lasers on? Okay. So what do you think, uh, co-pilot? Maybe come from the other side? Looks like there's little corals all over the rock right where I would. I would still go left side. Yeah. If you go right side, then... Um so there was Crash mentioned in the chat that we collect oh, gotcha. one of these uh, sponges that's overgrowing these right, corallium coral colonies. And we want to get a piece of sponge and also a, a piece of the coral that's overgrowing. Kay. Maybe something lower down near the base might be uh, one of the better collection areas. Oh, okay, okay so looks like lower branches. That gotcha. Maybe. That's what that, yeah. So left toe there, and then one of those. All right. That would be fine. So would I come, how would I grab it then? Would I just pierce the sponge with the jaws? Like sneak to the fingers? So we'd like to, to actually get a piece of the coral and... Uh, so if you just grab part of the skeleton, you should be able to break it off pretty easily. Okay. All right. So, and you'd like me to grab from the base? I, I might get a pretty big portion then. Um, there should be, yeah, maybe that branch that's on the left-hand side near the lasers. Would that be a good branch to grab? Okay. I think it'd be easier to get one of the right branches. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, watch, Lee. It's gonna, it's it'd be hard. I have to kind of set up on the port side, and that would be. I'd have to kind of work around the sponge with the arm. Is there something on the, on the right side of the sponge as we're looking at it now that would you think would be suitable? Um, could we zoom into that side just to take sure. a better look at it? Yeah. Would you come in video? Like it looks yeah, I'm not sure if there are two different corals here. Um, yeah, well, there's, I mean, there's this sponge at the base, but that's what we just collected. Kay. And we're looking at collecting this brown section of this uh, sponge coral combination. Um, yeah, I think it, thinking uh, one of these end branches, whichever one you can grab, uh, the easiest okay and the best plan of action will probably be to grab the branch and just break it off with the manipulator okay yeah i can cut it with the jaw all right video would you come back wide yeah i'd say park a little bit below it like this okay left toe in all right plant that left toe so we're going to make a collection of this really crazy coral encrusting sponge it seems to prefer to grow on the same uh, hemi or corallium skeleton, this dead skeleton of these really large pink corals. And we're going to try to get a piece uh, with a piece of that, uh, try to put that coral as bottom. well. And so people we'll studying uh, coral thing. aging can use that yeah, uh, for their the studies. We can figure out yeah. perhaps how old I this, this uh, skeleton is. Uh, the best the way to find so. out how old would be to take a section of the base. It, uh, but that would just take out the entire the colony uh, so of the skeleton and then all of the animals that yeah, are living on it. So we're just going to take one of the branches near the end and see what kind of sponge this is. This is this is so cool. I'm so excited. Okay. All right, I'm gonna turn the also the sponge on. rates uh, a nine out of ten on the relative spongy index, yeah. which is a measure sure. from sponge okay. at the far end it's, it's to not to sponge you. on the distal end of the scale. It's pretty spongy sponge. 
It's like and this, this particular one that, that we're looking at awesome has like really filled out the branches. Okay. It Maybe almost that. looks like Maybe. Okay. You know. it's a so coral like itself. Like it's become its own yeah, coral like kind of sponge get. fan. Yeah. So then yeah. I would want to have Reminds the mist uh, kind of all the way kind out. Kind of spray insulation or something like that, That's especially the color. Or, oh. Yeah. Let's get it close to see how it dangles in there, but make sure the coral cutters are on, on the right side. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's what I would do. I think you're going to find it's closer to the here. All right. Keep an eye on uh, Sirius for me, Mark. Yep. Will yeah. do. Yeah, I think you've been pretty stable. So. Yeah, I would yeah. agree. Okay, hydraulics coming on. Oh, stand down. Let me ramp you up a little bit more. Copy. There you are. All right. Okay. It's all right. It's a little late. Oh, I'm in the... There we go. We're in. Colors look good. Then yeah, what got you in that one-to-one -one mode last time was uh -huh. the, the long press. So just yeah, yeah, yeah tactile presses. Okay. Okay. So where are my cutters? My cutters are on the right side now. Yeah, they're good. Uh, you might. Yeah. Turn a little to starboard. Yeah. Is that what you're thinking? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Me too. I'm going to turn Sirius to port a little bit just to keep you in my frame here. So I can see the port side. Okay. Nice. Okay, that's a little bit more room. I don't want to get all twisted up. Yeah, I would agree. So, yeah. what are you thinking? Yeah, I'll try to open jaw and then try to get the outer jaw between the, in that air gap there. Sneak it in there. Can't okay. go down that close. But. All right, and then grab a piece. And then try to grab it, like, yeah. Yep. Okay, and then after I have it, jaw lock it, and then we'll. And then, like, twist and pluck it off. Uh huh. And then once it's free, I typically, like, try to get it up and over, like, the rock box at least. In okay. the event that it falls, it might. <laughs> it'll go in there. It'll go to infinity. Yeah. But yeah, and then I'll draw it out once we get out, up and out. But yeah. Okay. So are the cutters still in the right spot? Oh, yeah. yeah, they're in the inside. Yeah. All right, it's kind of hard to see then. So can I jaw lock it partially open? It's very difficult, but you can. Okay. You have to hold it in just the right position. All right, then I'll just feather it. Uh, grip for, I'll turn grip force down maybe to like three or four. For this guy, yeah. And then play with it to get a feel for it. Okay. So you know where it starts and stops at this grip force. So you know what you're dealing with. And then, yeah, but go in. Because <coughs> it changes the amount of the potentiometer used. Gotcha. With grip force, so.
Looks like we got part of the, uh, yeah. You could also suck it up, too. It's pretty small. Yeah, that is pretty small. Well, we'll get this part at least. Got some sponge and uh, yeah. Oil in there. Okay, so you're gonna go for jar four. Yeah. Okay. Oh, go for suction. Yeah. Copy. Or do you think that piece of coral is too big? Is it gonna no. get caught? Uh, I think it'll make it. Okay. All right. Would you rotate down on the mini then? When you get a moment, rotate down on the Zeus. Okay, Zeus is all the way down. I'm going to try to draw out just a little bit more here. Okay, okay I think that's pretty much it. Okay, I got eyes on drawer. All right. Okay, uh, I'm going to go to drawer. What, what's the next drawer? The jar four. Right? Jar four. Okay. Jar four. All right. All right, I've begun the suction motor here. Okay. You see flow? Uh, yes. Okay. We got some flow. Okay, great. There we go. All right. That's it. So should I try and go for the sponge or the core or the? Uh, so get the end of the jaws close to the nozzle first, slowly okay. open, and then that'll get sucked in first, and then we'll go for the upper coral part. So go, I would go up a little bit, otherwise this okay. is going to, yeah. yeah. Got it. Yep. And then. It's, it's going to get stuck, I think. What do you think? No, I think it'll make it in. All right, here we go. get that sponge portion in that's in your jaws. Okay, we got the coral in there. There it is. Boom. And sponge. There is coral and sponge pieces in there. Okay, suction's off. Copy. Jar four. Got it. Watch lead pilot. Go ahead, pilot. So we, we got some of it. Do you want me to try and get a bigger piece or... Um, yeah, I think the the sponge bits just sort of came apart, and that might be difficult for taxonomists to use. Okay. Um, if maybe you can grab more of the spongier bit. Okay. Yeah, that should be pretty easy. Okay. If you rotate up, thank you, co-pilot. Draw back in. Copy. For now. I'm gonna hold while you do that. Okay. We're in. Oh. Um. You get it. What's up? Jar uh, three also has a uh, crab in it. Uh oh. Copy. Um. Were they thinking go for the bio box and a bigger chunk, or were they thinking for? Yeah. Yeah. Watch lead pilot. Go ahead, pilot. Uh, you can just be advised. There's a little crab in jar three. I see it. It's yeah. adorable. <laughs> and uh, so would you prefer like a bigger piece of the sponge in the bio box or just to try and get a larger chunk and put it into the same can? I, I would think I would prefer it in the bio box just okay. because the canister seems to rip the sponge apart into tiny pieces. Okay. Copy that. Okay, would you rotate up with the mini? Copy. And maybe come down on that piece that's sticking out? Yeah. Would you rotate up with the Zeus? Will this be two different samples then? Yeah. Okay. I would count this as one sample. It's just uh, two 
parts of what, but just because we want to make sure oh, okay. we get the the right amount. Okay. Uh, uh, but unless there's a different way, you usually do it. Okay. So what do you yeah. think? Co-pilot, just kind of come down and grab a hunk. Yeah, I'd say carefully. Um, okay. <laughs> a gentle squeeze. Okay. What, just a little off the top. <laughs> Yeah, but the structure of the sponge can be really it. important to taxonomists, and now it's all tiny pieces within our canister. I like to put the uh, craft controller on my lap. Good try. Like the top ledge, uh -huh. that leg right there. Try that. Ah, that's much better. Um, and then you can try grip lock with a partial close. So basically, what you're looking for is you're waiting for the jaw to be completely still, uh -huh. not closing, not opening, and just very carefully press that grip lock. It's very difficult, but it might slowly squeeze in or it might slowly open. Um, Okay, I've got jaw lock on. Great. And then, uh, so we can go port outer or we can go starboard inner. Take your pick. Uh, let's go port. Port, copy. All right, so do you want to get the arm kind of over that port side yeah. before we take off? That makes your manipulation. Oh, over the port side? Yeah, we have to go to port outer, so it's the way, okay. one way out there. So you can bring it like nice and easy way out over and then that way when I draw out and we're floating it's less manipulating that's a beautiful sample all right if you use the, yeah, the manips I'll tell you how far you are off the oh, uh, gotcha drawer there okay all right and then uh, we can take off and then I'll do the drawer thing okay Prepare my track the pins, extend the port pin. Okay, maybe uh, I'll bring this one up for just a minute here just so you can. Okay, so on. I'll go, I'll just come off the wall, go out in the water column, auto heading, auto depth. Uh, we'll make sure there's clearance in the drawer. We'll extend the drawer. I'll put it in. Yep. And, uh, Nav, you can uh, help us uh, watch the drift on the vehicle. Yeah. While okay. uh, co-pilot and I are okay. putting the sample away. Let me uh, just finish some notes here real quick, but I'll be I'll be ready. Okay. All right. You ready, co-pilot? Yeah. All I have to do is extend the drawer. Okay. Do you rotate Sirius' heading a little bit to yeah. keep us in view? Right, let me try XY to copy. I don't think, oh, we don't have bottom lock. There, it won't really work. I think you're okay here. Okay. Ready for me to extend the draw? Okay. Yep. All right. All the way. Okay. Okay. So that's kind of as much as I can get on my shoulder. Yep. It's perfect. Uh, to get a little more, you can wrist up and then, yeah. That's exactly, yeah. There you go. That's about as far as you can reach. Nice. There you go. Boom. Nice. Okay, I'm going to track that drawer. Copy. Uh, thanks for that, pilot. You're welcome, actually. So we have officially.
actually collected a section of that strange sponge that keeps overgrowing yeah, right coral there. Copy. Uh, skeleton. So that's really okay, cool. Okay, hydraulics off. Uh, I'm excited to find out more about that sponge because I was questioning yeah, I whether have, uh, it was a demo sponge yeah, or a glass sponge. that? You can put jar camera on, back on 12. I, ah, I stole 12. I got it. Yeah, no I, worries. I stole 12 from you. No, no worries. I saw it. Right. I just want to give you a view of the material. Oh, we did that. All right. Okay, you guys good. So yep. I turned the ports. So I should turn back to starboard towards the hill a little bit here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we, yeah, we got about 30 minutes of bottom time. Okay, I'll move to starboard and get lined back up, co-pilot. Okay. Awesome sample, Andy. Thank you. All right, I'm going to turn the forward lights off. Watch the nav. We should reduce that backscatter. Yeah, I just wanted to let you know, um, just for your notes, I labeled those two as the same uh, sample label in our notes. Okay. And just noted okay. jar four and port outer. Thanks, so, that's perfect. Okay, and then also note 30 minutes, bottom time left. Thank you, Nav. Just going to line up with that sonar return here for Copy. me. That's about it. Okay. I'm at 220, looks like. So what do we look like? A little bit to the my left, yeah. That. Yeah, so uh, I believe we have more than made up for our inability to take samples yesterday. We have a pretty good sized complement of samples in both the bio boxes as well as our suction chambers. Do you want to rotate the jars? Yeah, Which is good. So my mind. Yeah. So there's no accidental samples right now. Yeah. Like, and what we do is leave it on six. We've got yeah. about a half hour of seven. bottom time we'll left. Five, um, yeah. It's a pretty extensive transit up and down the water column I'm at this sure, depth. I'm not so sure. Again, we landed at about 2,600 meters uh, water depth. Just climb in the tube earlier. <laughs> oh. So I'm we're going to sure continue our planned descent and just the, uh, with the original sample. see what we can see with the half hour that we have left. Yeah, we have four collections from today's dive, which is really great, uh, seeing as yesterday we were unable to make any collections. And right now we're viewing this extremely dense deep sea uh, coral and sponge community. Uh, the main players that are in your screen right now are these very small like soft corals that seem to be growing over now. all the rocks and the sponges. And then we've been seeing a number yep. of really cool glass sponges, demo sponges, and uh, corallium colonies, those pink coral colonies. And real estate here seems to be at a premium. There are corals on sponges, sponges on corals, sponges on sponges, corals on corals. It's uh, a really densely packed area. Which isn't necessarily Nothing. surprising, but is absolutely fantastic yeah, to behold. And, and given yeah. the depth uh, at 2,500 meters, it's it's pretty pretty a dense community. Yeah, something that uh, has been pretty conspicuous is the relative lack of fish and organisms swimming in the water column as compared to a lot of our dives at shallower depths. Is that a coincidence? So I've actually seen a number of fish today, but we've been so distracted nice. by all the other uh, sessile organisms that we've off. missed out on them. Okay. They've been zooming around in the background or uh, close okay. by us before we can get some good looks at them. Uh, I saw, I think, an ophidiid fish, a rat tail fish, and those are the fishes that we generally see in this type of environment. We also see synaptobranchid eels and um, I can't, uh, I was trying to think of some other fishes. Uh, we, we Didn't we see a uh, chonocops? Yeah, that was a chonocops that we saw yesterday. Um. So coffin fishes or uh, frog fishes depending on which is your preferred common name. So there are fish down here, and 
a lot of times you'll notice more fish if you watch the Sirius view. Uh, they tend to like to swim behind the vehicle or up in the water column. I've also seen a number of halosaurs today. Those are those long skinny fish that swim in the water column. Sometimes it's a good way to uh, invoke seeing something just by saying that we haven't seen too much of it during a dive. That was definitely working for us so far, yesterday and today. I was saying, oh, I, we haven't seen hardly any of these soft corals, and now they're on every surface that we look at. And yesterday I was saying, oh, we don't usually see this association between black corals and brittle stars, and yet it went to prove me wrong. That one was really just lounging between the branches of the black corals and waving its tendril uh, at Deep Discover. And this uh, pink coral fan we're looking at right now is just fantastic. It's very, very large. And you can tell that uh, it's actually hard to see the lasers because we're actually really far away from this coral. But those two red dots that are right in center screen are 10 centimeters or four inches apart. And compare that, I usually use my finger or uh, my hand to count how many of those 10 centimeter segments can make it across the width of this yeah, coral. Pilot. Pilots. Yeah, that one looked to be about a meter in diameter. That's a big coral. And especially given that these corals grow at very slow rates, uh, less than a centimeter per year, uh, and depending on the coral, right even less We're than that. Moving. So this Bye -bye. coral is over 100 years old. Hey, watch, Lee, we just did a pilot change. Um, <coughs> before I leave here, is there anything else we want to take a look at here? Uh, I think we're good here. Okay. Uh, let's keep moving on. Thank you, pilot. Sure. And that just speaks to kind of the uh, so what was the, the direction of our last scale set that, that we look at in we're our going, respective yeah. disciplines, Megan, because a centimeter a per year so is a really two, two, fast five, rate of sedimentation in the two, two, geological three, zero, world. Four, five was the last move. And a centimeter per year is extremely fast for the growth of uh, these deep water corals as well. Uh, a lot of corals grow at even slower rates than that. Yeah, it looks like the 220 for now. Yeah, I can push up. Uh, push uphill here. But these pink corals tend to be some of the faster Anything growing of, of the corals. Yeah, it looks like uh, down at these depths. A good return out there. Uh, yeah, might be black steep, corals steep and, and yeah. uh, bamboo corals tend to grow a little bit slower and tend to have longer lifespans in comparison to some of these corallium corals. My camera up to three five degrees. Sounds good. Looks like we've brought the upper. I Which guess, reminds me, I haven't in. seen a lot of bamboo coral uh, recently. We saw a few colonies at the beginning of our dive, coming up. Um, and we haven't seen any of the really long whips that we saw during yesterday's dive. Full wide there video. Yeah, um, Scott and I were discussing Scott. that earlier. How definitely not those on tree room at seamount. And I also asked whether so they observed any of so those on the seamounts uh, to Give the southeast. Take. So those would be geologically younger. And he said that they haven't observed them there either. So maybe just a bear only thing for some reason. It could also be depth or uh, perhaps the topography of the area. Being a really long width yeah, can, can be uh, like advantageous like if you're uh, in an area uh, where the current little, isn't very strong near the substrate, and like so being wall, very long and like up a, in the yeah. water column can be very helpful. Or the current is yeah. comes from variable uh, directions, yeah, two, two, zero, and as a whip, two, two, uh, your polyps can now. feed in any Sounds direction yeah, because it can time. move yeah. easily within the water column. And these fan structures, like these corallium, tend to orient themselves per perpendicular to Bridge most frequent out. current so in their area that they're living.
uh, and that allows the current to pass the through the fan range and the pollen can then feed on any particular two two matter zero, that is in the water column. Knots. Roger, thank you, Bridge. A lot of life down here. There sure is a lot of life down here, which is really interesting because um, back in the olden days before people started exploring the oceans, the, well, they used to believe that there would be no years. life in the deep ocean because there's no light down there. And everything we knew about science said that life needed uh, light in order to live. but uh, we've come to find that that is not the case at all, and in fact, we can see extremely dense and complex communities in the deep sea. Yeah, I think the term that they used to use for the light-free zone was the uh, azoic zone, or without life. And uh, as we can see now in uh, crystal clear, high definition, it's not the case. Not at all. Go ahead, Bridge. And even in areas where you're not seeing these extremely large corals and sponges, that doesn't mean that there isn't life down there. Uh, in sedimented Roger areas, there are lots of animals so that associate with the sediment. Uh, it's just that okay. we're particularly interested in these areas of hard substrate in the deep sea that support these areas of high biodiversity could, uh, on sea mounts and in canyons. And, and that's because these large corals and sponges do yes, live sir. in these areas, okay. and these areas yeah, become hot spots good. of Pretty biodiversity, start, attracting associated organisms. Uh, yeah, just organisms. spoke with the co-pilots. They're good with that heading chain, so you guys can proceed at any time. Just let me know when you're finished up and what heading you're going to. Roger. Thank you, Bridge. Right now, I'm really enjoying the topography of this area. You can see uh, the rounded lobes of what might have been old pillow lava flows underneath all of this beautiful biology that's encrusting the rocks. All right. Okay, watch lead. We're uh, just waiting for the ship to catch up and Sirius to swing a little bit closer, but. I'll just explore this immediate area uh, until then. Just let me know if you see anything you want to take a closer look at. Sounds good, pilot. Uh, can we zoom that coral that's pink and uh, has that yellow base? Sure, just dead ahead. Dead ahead. Yeah. I'll get lasers on it first. Get some size and then we'll do a closer zoom. Yeah, so this coral is very large as well. Roger, thank you, Bridge. As you go Those forward, I can come down a little bit. Lasers are okay. 10 centimeters Maybe apart, and it has a very wide base. So this coral is over a meter wide. Pilot ship heading changes it zero, my four, five. just because of its Copy shape. Copy. It looks, and the fact that the base is such a yellow color, I would have assumed immediately that it was another corallium coral, but... If, as we take a closer look, maybe we can learn a little bit more about this coral. It's really just stunning how every single available uh, surface is completely encrusted with those soft corals as well. We've had that for a good 30 meters of ascent now or something like that. Yeah, and it was really interesting that okay, let's start uh, there the was like this very... Uh, distinct line where those became even more apparent. For you, but. So I'm trying to decide if this is another hemi or uh, another corallium coral, pink coral, or if it might be a bubblegum coral. You want to get a the way the polyps soon? aren't gathered at the ends well. of the branches makes can, me think that ID. it's another uh, pink coral. 
Lost my tether, but sorry. oh, now that we're even closer, I think I do see uh, gathers of polyps at the ends of the branches. Just leave it there. I'll try to. So it actually get might be a uh, bubblegum coral instead of a pink coral. A lot of these pink corals and bubblegum corals look very similar morphologically uh, when you're zoomed out. And it can also be pretty difficult to tell nice. which one they are when they're zoomed in, too. Uh, it's not until we either take a sample or get the specimen in the lab that it becomes really apparent. But my best guess on this one would be bubblegum coral. Uh, just given the way the skeleton looks and the way the polyps look uh, and how bumpy uh, the s surface of these branches are, yeah, just uh, away, yeah. tells me... I think I'm a bubblegum coral. Copy that. Yeah, I can picture this uh, in the lab with the sample that That's we had collected earlier uh, with that really pink stained yeah. ethanol as well as just the bumpy branches of the skeleton. It looks pretty similar. Obviously, minus the polyps that we're seeing right now. get a little bit more light for your art. And I did think I saw uh, Paragorgia earlier in the dive, so it's really cool to see such a large uh, colony of Paragorgia. This one is particularly complex. Is that a full zoom there? Okay. Well, hopefully that's enough for an ID. Thank you, pilot. That was a great view. Sure. Okay. Well, whatever, your clear video. Yeah, and Ellen ahead. from DFO uh, says that looks pretty similar to the one that we saw and sampled yeah, dive sure. one in the Gully Marine Protected Area in Canadian waters. Back up. That and that's not unexpected. We are relatively yeah, close like to that is. area. So it could be that um, these different paragorges are actually gonna, connected genetically. Uh, the corals are sessile when they're adults like this, but their larva their, um, can move throughout the water column and move with currents. So it's, it's not unusual for us to see connections across seamounts and canyons. Yeah, and things that we would uh, might not know or might be stored in separate silos of information if we weren't doing this cruise in a transboundary manner where we weren't artificially separating the Gully Marine Protected Area from Retriever Seamount where we are right now. And there are a number of groups out there that are working on uh, how these animals uh, move from seamount to seamount and how they disperse across the ocean. And so that's one of the important questions we're trying to find out about uh, corals and sponges is how they disperse and how these areas that are geographically widespread are connected as one population. And All you can right. see at the end of these branches, uh, there's Come been some line. damage, but it also looks like yeah, uh, the coral has recovered from that damage and began to grow again. Should go ahead and put in like another 10. Yeah, that sounds good to me. Do, uh, I'll just come up and over it, Art. They're still midway through their heading so this change. this is definitely a nice okay. place to definitely. be a coral, right at the top of right. this four local five. high. I think I can reach and you'll always there, seem though, to find okay. a really big colony yeah, a in those yeah. prime spots These, uh, along these local highs on seamounts. A little bit more than normal, it seems like, uh, even at this depth. And that's because the currents are accelerated in these areas. As the water flows across and around these local right. highs, Back boulders, and pinnacles, like uh, here, huh? you get more food passing by the four four coral five? or sponge per unit time. I haven't heard any yeah, they said and four or five, so. food means more growth. Oh, can you uh, kill my headlights? Sure. Thanks. Yep, and that's another example of the same phenomena that we're coming into view with right now. 
So this coral that we're seeing might be another Paragorgia. You'll notice it also has that yellowed base. And I sort of notice that pattern where the yellowing of the base uh, in the Pacific as well. Every time I thought something might be a uh, hemichorallium or a corallium coral, uh, if it had that yellow base and we took a close look at it, it always ended up being a Paragorgia. And so now it's part of my frame of reference as to what could be or could not be uh, corallium. And right next to it on the boulder to the left is what I would uh, to to identify as a corallium coral. And you can see the difference in the colors between those two colonies. And as we zoom in, you're definitely seeing those large clusters of polyps at the ends of the branches. And so this one that we're looking at right now is a paragorgia or bubblegum coral. Pilot, can we take a look at that um, coral that was just on screen in front of the fan that we're looking at now? Sure, just to the I bottom? Was, yeah, just yeah. to the bottom. Sure. That looked really different. Can just I wasn't it sure if video. it was a type of hydrozoan or... Um, Maybe it's a type of bryozoan. I'm not sure. Well, it's not the best background, but I think I could throw the headlights on again. Okay, uh, yeah, so sure. it's growing off or of a rock, right and I don't believe it's an octocoral. So my best guess would be that this yeah, particular on one that we're looking at is a type of uh, hydrozoan, or not. Um. As I lean closer, I'm seeing pinnate tentacles on these polyps. So this is an octocoral, and it has sort of a golden uh, axis, so it's a type of chrysogorgid coral. They're just some of the smallest, most delicate branches and polyps that I've seen. That is a very cool coral. Yeah, and it looks like one of those, uh, is that a plated polychaete uh, associated with it in the background? It might be, and I think I'm seeing an anemone as well in the branches. Yeah, we definitely haven't seen uh, a significant. Still want another 10 meters at 220 of the community we're as an enemy is at least an enemy so. of appreciable yeah, size, move. I should yep. say, on this dive we're today, almost there, so. which definitely stands in sharp contrast nice to some of the video. sites that we saw, particularly the really soft sediment benthic areas where the anemones were. A really uh, dominant a community tilt. member. Let's see if there's anything better. Jeez, rotator wants to go, huh? Oh, there's some. And a few other amplified looking things within there as okay. well, making their ways through. Roger Bridge, thank you. Yes, those like to are put in one last position move, please. And you then get a at the range on this one rock zero meters, all there. those soft corals. Bearing two two zero, speed decimal two knots. That is very Roger, cool. Roger, thank you, Bridge. It totally caught me by surprise. I thought it was something else, and. And as we zoomed in, it revealed itself as being a Chrysogorgia coral. Very, very cool. All right. So, clear her video. Yeah. Okay. Headlights coming off. Got me. Securing still cam. Got out of proud ear. Move. That is a beautiful coral colony. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, now that I, we've taken a look at that uh, Chrysogorgid coral, I'm seeing a yeah, few in the background, well. those very delicate uh, bottle brush colonies. Yeah, similar body plan and morphology to the bamboo, but just uh, not growing anywhere near as long. 
Yeah, we do see this bottle brush shape a lot of times in uh, Chrysogorgia colonies. Um, the one we see most often in the Pacific is the Chrysogorgia geniculata, uh, but it tends to be a little bit Tethers larger and more robust looking than the ones the that we're seeing okay, here. Okay. So I'll it's definitely a different species. Up. Is that a sponge growing on the Paragorgia? That's what it looked like to me. Yeah, it does look like it's on the on the coral. That's cool. Top down a little bit. You want to come in there, video? Yeah, just a quick zoom. Just confirm that it's actually on the coral. Yeah. Huh. That's really crazy. And like a branch of, is that coral growing from the sponge or is that the same type of coral, uh, just not living? It could be. Yeah, that could be a dead skeleton piece and then the sponge is actually on the back here. side of this coral, but we couldn't see it from the front side. Huh. Go figure. Okay, let's come Very, live. very cool. It would be fascinating to see a uh, succession of these creatures from an unsettled area to see what the actual order is of uh, settlement. Obviously, you'd need a hundred years or more to observe that. Yes, these animals grow very, very slowly. So to watch this community develop, uh, we would have had to start time lapsing a Navigate couple off. hundred years ago or more. This community Kept could be thousands of years watch old. Watch these up to date with the uh, off bottom time. I'm gonna give them a five minute warning here. Just a minute. Yeah, copy that. Sounds good. I think I, I heard you guys talking. I wasn't wasn't quite sure. Setup should be pretty easy. Um, I think I just need to turn starboard. 180 degrees, and you'll stay in the direction you're facing. Oh, that's easy. <coughs> Watch, lead this is now. Go ahead, now. So we have just about five minutes left about in time. Confirmed. Thank you. Is there enough time to grab one of these uh, round uh, mass sponges? Uh, stand by. Let me uh, talk to the nav and dive soup here. Which, uh, which of the sponges would it be? Those dense round ones uh, that are on the rocks everywhere. Okay, yeah, uh, stand so by. So Ellen Kenchington was interested in collecting one of these demo sponges, hey the Dan. big round ones, and we're looking to see if we have enough time to make a collection of one. We have approximately five minutes left on bottom. Um, and if we can find a nice small colony to grab, uh, we will do that. Going. Where are we going with it? Uh, it has to be a star. So maybe one of box. these the very the round ones are that are about the size of a baseball would make the best collection. Yeah, I'm, I think I'm just in the middle of that move. If we don't it's have enough far, time, we have plenty of things to okay. see in this area. There are so many beautiful corals and sponges. Okay. Just coating all these rocks on retriever seamount. We are currently at a depth of 2,498 meters. Watch that, is this one just right below the lasers? Would that work? Um, yeah, that would be fine. Okay, is that the same spe species or? 
I don't think we know what the species is. Okay. It, it looks like it could be in the Geodidae family. Uh, another option is that rounder one off to the left, okay. depending on where is a good place for you to land and grab. Okay. And do we know what, uh, if we could just grab them with the jaws and they'll be brittle or soft? Uh, this or? is very dense. It should be uh, easy to just pick up. Okay. All right, co-pilot, you want to get me spun up, please? Sure. And, uh, Chris Wright, if you uh, don't mind putting the serious Yeah, we've been seeing these demo sponges throughout the entire the dive, just spotted screen. between you know every other is? sponge yeah. and coral we've been seeing. So it's quite common in this area. Okay. And we've Pretty seen similar easy. sponges on other dives. One. And there are a number of initiatives trying to put together yeah. and piece together these puzzle pieces that these sponges present across the Atlantic Ocean. So there are a number of people who are really interested okay. in looking up. at the genetics of this sponge and also confirming the identity of this sponge. So starboard box is the only thing that available right now. Could we come in partial on main zoos, please? Hey, can we come in on mini zoos too? I'll do it slowly. You ready for it? Yeah, ready. Can we come full wide on mini Zeus? Yeah, I'm pushing you a little bit now, I think. Okay, come down on mini Zeus a little. You got it. Close it up. Yeah, sure. Okay. Starboard enter. Yes. All right. Thank you. Now that we have that geodidy <coughs> sample on board, I okay. believe we All will right, be close us for bottom time today. All right. Yes, I believe that is the end of our dive, and we Thanks. have yep. had a great dive today. Just chock full of sponges and corals and just amazing biology and some really cool igneous geology, if I do say so myself. So, uh, this is the end of uh, dive later. number nine uh, on Retriever yeah, Seamount. We will be having a midwater dive tomorrow yeah, we just come up a bit. above Bear Seamount, um, and we'll have the planning call for that dive 
in about 10 minutes. Uh, um, so right. our planning dive is scheduled for yeah, uh, 3.15, like so about 15 yeah. minutes from now. Uh, we're doing things a little bit differently because this is a mid-border dive, and we're going to have a number of different scientists joining us for that dive uh, that are experts in mid-water fauna. So we're going to have a completely different dive than normal uh, that's going to consist of doing uh, long transects going across uh, area of open water at a specific depth. Uh, I think the first dive is going to be very near bottom, so you uh, benthic folks, if you get online right at the morning, you might yeah, be able so to I'm catch really some glimpses of the bottom like uh, as we do yeah. the first transect, and then subsequently yeah. we're going to transect at different depths uh, sure, because sure, a lot of clear. times we see different yeah, animals in different layers of the ocean. Yeah, so okay it'll be a really exciting time for those of you who have always wondered what is in the middle yeah, between the surface of the ocean and the bottom of the ocean. All right. So with that, this is Jeff Bell, your geology lead, signing off. And I hope to see you tomorrow during our midwater dive at Bear Seamount. This is Megan Cutts, your biology lead, signing off. Good eyes on the tether there. Yep. I'll push out a little more. Okay. Got a 20 meter delta. Looking good. All right. I am lined up with the ship. Okay. I'll start raising until I'm in your camera there. Okay. Line up with the ship and turn to zeroed. Great. Got auto heading in for now. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. Delta decreasing. Start to see your light pool. pool. Yeah. I'm going to come out of auto head. Great. E easing on that forward way, but going to keep a little bit in. Okay. okay. I'm going to start to bump on the. Uh, I went off the screen, didn't I? Hey, workshop, this is co-pilot. Uh. Can you uh, turn up the volume? Uh, uh, okay. Coming up. Roger. on that for a little bit of took out Z bias and she shot up. Hey Nav if in that same monitor that you switched to Sirius, could you switch it to the one that says starboard S D? Roger that. Yeah, great. Thanks. Check, check, one, two, check. Got you, Levi. You on A or B? Uh, do you still want more flow than that? Lars and I think that might be sufficient. Uh, but if you want more, we can certainly do that. No, that's fine. I just wanted to make sure uh, we had enough. But uh, if it looks good to you, we're uh, set then. Yeah, uh, I think if it looks good to you down there, then uh, I think we're set. Thanks, Levi. Okay.
Okay, I'm averaging like 31. Sounds good. I'm catching back up to you. That's a good point with the HPU, it's probably what it is. Yeah. So. so Sean just said check with you guys when we wanted to bring up the ship over over ground. At what point you guys were comfortable with that? Okay. <laughs> 